That is it for us today. Okay, I don't know what. Whatever it is, it's not right on the teleprompter. I don't know what that is. I've never seen that. There it is. We are going to do this again. Okay, but... Yeah, I can't read it. There's no, there's no words on it. There's no words there to play us out. What does that mean, to play us out? What is... I don't know what that means, to play us out. What does that mean? To end the show? Yeah. All right, go, go. That's tomorrow, and that is a... That's tomorrow, and that is it for us today, and we will leave you with a... I can't do it. We'll do it live. Okay. We'll do it live! Fuck it! Do it live! I can... I'll write it, and we'll do it live! Fucking thing sucks! That's tomorrow, and that is it for us today. I'm Bill O'Reilly. Thanks again for watching. We'll leave you with Sting and a cut off his new album. Everybody, it is your boy Lou Martinez, aka Big Chief Burrito, here with you live on a Monday, season two, episode one, Fireside Chats with Big Chief Burrito, live via twitch.tv slash 2M Burrito, youtube.com slash 2AM Burrito, or Facebook.com slash 2AM Burrito. You can also follow us on Twitter. Make sure. And today we're going to be talking about the couple of things with our boy, uh, Mr. Uh, Dimitri Green, a little preview of our bracket bit for later on, but he is part of something called the Black Lives Matter Film Challenge. He's going to explain to us what it is about, 
We're going to be talking about general stuff happening in the local film community. We're going to talk about sports and anything that comes up. So thank you very much for coming on. Make sure you leave a like on the stream, wherever it is that you are seeing it. Make sure that you do, if you have a question about the challenge or about anything related to what we're talking about, you leave a comment, leave a question, let us know what's up. We're just vibing here on a Monday. Without further ado, 2 a.m. burrito player, Mr. Demetri Green. Ooh, what you got? What you got for us there, Mr. Dimitri? What is it? What, what you holding in your hand, man? Uh, this is one of my favorite shoes, man. Um, grew up uh, idolizing a lot of hoopers, but Penny Hardaway to me just had the dopest shoe. Like Jordan has like 40 pairs of shoes. Penny has like one shoe that like lasts forever and they just keep making them every year. But this is the uh, the shooting, the, uh, the phone posit shooting star. So you got the stars, you got the stars over here on the new buck. Okay. You know, uh, you have the all white uh, midsole that kind of resembles the uh, phone posit pro Tim Duncan versions. Okay. You have the carpet fiber right there. You know, on the inside of the tongue, it says balling is like, oh, wait, hold on, get in the camera. Balling is what I do. It's a pretty cool shoe. There's not a lot of them out there, and I was able to get me a pair. So, you know, yeah, uh, thank you, unemployment. So, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and put that down. <laughs> now, see, this is this is where you're spending your stimulus money? <laughs> Hey, hey, you know how? Well, your mic's a little bit cutting that out. What would you say? I said we're all trying to get a little bit ourselves, right? Since we Absolutely. Can't... Absolutely, I got to make sure I don't talk over you because I think when I talk, I cut you off for some reason. So okay. let me let me make sure. Um, you know how sometimes you can take things one of two different ways. You can take it as an insult, or you can just kind of let it brush off your shoulder. Yeah. So, you know, I, I smoke heavy, right? I, I mean, most of the stuff that's on my Instagram account, a lot of the stuff that's on there, I, I show that I, you know, I roll myself six or seven blunts for the weekend or 10, 10 joints for the week or whatever. I do just how people do their prep work in the kitchen. I do my prep work when I roll up. Yeah. Um, so I posted a picture a couple of weeks and we were talking about this because there's a sort of uh, there's a sort of white savior among us. Uh, I'm not. I'm not going to say who it is because I don't. I don't think they want the smoke. But there is a white savior uh, lurking in the shadows of the local San Diego film community, inserting themselves into conversations, trying to make sure that people understand the right way to think about stuff. Um, and one of the things that that first kind of put that on my radar is a while back I put a picture up of a bunch of joints that I had rolled or a bunch of blunts that I had rolled just you know for me for whatever just because I like you know I, I'm not I'm not a I've, I'm, I've been a legalizer person for whatever so why the fuck am I gonna hide now that it's legal right um right and their comment was I guess your stimulus check hit <laughs> so that's why I was like that's one of those things where I was like nah like I was gonna be like nah man we I smoke good all the time. That has nothing to do with it. But I was like, in the back of my mind, I was like, should I get offended by this? You know, that's low key offensive, though. <laughs> yeah, to to I mean, to me, not maybe yeah. to an average everyday smoker, but to me, I'm like, oh, the audacity, right? That you think I need a stimulus check to smoke good. This is not what's happening. Um, but we'll get more into that later, see if we can drop some more clues, see if people can find out who the white savior is. Uh, and then we'll take it from there. Uh, me and Kenny did a Juneteenth episode about six, seven months ago where we kind of talked about all the shit that's happening uh, in the world. And we talked a lot about, about the protests earlier and stuff like that. And over the last year, there's been a lot of attempts um, by... I don't want to say the powers that be, but like institutions, companies, uh, film organizations and stuff to sort of reach out and say, you know, even DoorDash has a, you know, black merchants sort of tab. Um, there's been a, there's been an effort. I don't know if it's been super effective in every instant, but there's been an effort to sort of, to sort of reach out to more black voices, minority voices, stuff like that. Is this, I guess this would be the attempt locally to sort of put something together to 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 sort of get in front of not in front of that, but to sort of you know say you know this is us doing our part. Is that kind of how you feel about it? Uh, for me, yeah, I definitely think so. It's been a wave, and I think the wave for me it started back when uh, black people uh, 
were filmmakers, right? Black people actually started to, um, so to speak, uh, protest the uh, the Academy Awards. And then, like next year, Mahershala, Mahershala Ali, and you know, it, it, it kind of it kind of steamrolled from there, really. And it shows you the power of filmmaking and why we do what me and you both do, Lou, and, and share our stories and all the hard work you put into producing and and whatnot. So. Um, we want our stories to be heard and we want them to have impact. And when it hit the Academy Awards, that's when the waves start hitting. And now going all the way up through all the protests with the Black Lives Matter movement, people are jumping on board. And the, the thing that when they jump on board, the thing that you look at, no matter what company it is, is like, are you just jumping on the wave? Like, what are your intentions? Are your intentions, is this going to drive home more, more revenue or do you care about Black people? And I talk to my mom about this all the time. And I said, my answer is, I don't really give a damn. Like, I don't care why you do it, right? Like, I don't care why you put that one black person in the newsroom. I don't care why you gave an extra scholarship to that one black kid who might not have got it in the previous year, as long as you do it. You know, it's not about people liking you. It's about people treating you right and treating you the same. And that's the way I look at it. So is film consortium san diego a group that me and you have both been a part of in and out for the last how many years you know trying to say okay we're going to do our part now i believe so and and good for them good for them you know it's, it's a it's a cool thing so why so not for you, for you the um the action in front of the intent is not a big deal right Okay, as long as you as long as you're taking the action, then how, whatever the intent was, I'm gonna give you a pass for because you're taking the action, even though you might feel like you're forced into it a little bit, or be like, "Well, man, we need to sh we need to hop on this wave." As long as you're taking the action, you're forgiving the fact that the intent might be lagging behind. Yes, and and I'll give you another example of this, Lou. I was in college, right, and I was in a black student union, right, uh, for you know, all four years of my college career. And uh, that's, 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 I'm, it wasn't a, a fraternity, was it? Cause that's cultural appropriation. Cause that's Greek letters. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but no, no, uh, black, uh, black student union is just a, uh, campus organization. And we put on, we host events for different causes. And each year, what would happen is my college Culver Stockton college would have an award, uh, ceremony for the best, uh, student organization, and I think black like the black um, the black student union won like three out of four years, if not all four years. And uh, there were other student organizations that were putting on really good events, and they were really getting upset about this. And I said to my fellow colleagues at the time, I was like, you know, we're in a white dominated school. We we live through the liquidated racism that's here on campus. Liquidated meaning racism without speaking they might not speak to you a certain way but you can understand by the way you're treated that you're receiving racism you know um without without words uh it was very prevalent all four years we all witnessed it we all talked about it canton missouri is a place that you don't know about lou most people don't know about canton missouri it's predominantly white not a lot of black people there and most white people at that campus were meeting a black person for their very first time so they already had stereotypes and all kind of things in their head and I said, you know, for all that we go through on this campus and don't really speak up to it a whole lot, we don't make a big fuss, we'll take the damn trophy, all right? Like, you guys can just shut up. Like, you guys shut the hell up. The scholarship money on your end outweighs the scholarship money on our end by a landslide. There's plenty of other awards that we miss. We get this one damn trophy every year. And we can, we can ask and demand more if we want to. But for right now, we'll just take the stupid trophy and you guys can just shut the hell up. Like that that's just the way I felt about it. So they at least gave us some kind of consolation to say, hey, good job. Well, you know, we'll take we'll take our damn trophies and, and walk away with them. You might not know this about me, Dimitri Green, but I own a piece of a tattoo shop in Missouri right now, actually. Yeah. Yeah, your brother, right? Yeah, little brother opened up a tattoo in Troy, Missouri. Actually, shout out Main Street Tattoo. If anybody watching in Missouri area. 380 Main Street, <laughs> Troy, Missouri. Uh, tattoo shop opening soon. If you need to get some ink done, he's he's the, he's, he's he's doing a lot of my a lot of my work. But no, so yeah, so you'll you'll take the trophy, you'll take the actions because even though you understand that there might be a little bit of a hint of racism or a hint of forced into it, you know, you're gonna give people the pass on that because of the fact that the action is taken. But in some cases. You got to admit, in some cases, the 
the intent behind the action is a lot of clear is a lot clearer you know and not necessarily always for the best way sometimes it's literally it feels like people are are, are being forced into it uh-huh. Right. Which after hundreds of years of, of the bullshit that that you that you've been through and that, you know, my people have been through and everybody's a lot of people has been through uh, is 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 kind of like the the least that somebody could do. Right. Uh huh. And what and how long is it going to last? People people want to act like it's going to keep going up, up from here. If we're looking late, <laughs> it's not exactly like that. So. You Racism know. ended with Barack Obama. Everybody knows that, Dimitri. Right, right. <laughs> right. We got we got unity now, man. <laughs> we all know that we can talk a professional language in front of camera, in front of our business meetings, whatever we're doing, and we get behind camera, behind closed doors, and it's something completely different. And I say, you know what? Keep that shit behind the camera. Keep that shit behind the closed doors. And treat us right. That's the way I. That's the way I look at it. You're gonna have what you're gonna feel the way you're gonna feel, but treat us right. All right. So give us the nuts and bolts of the competition or the challenge. How did it originate, and what and what do people need to do to be involved with it, or what kind of projects should they be bringing to the table? Okay. So February 13th, we'll be having a live stream for the Black Lives Matter uh, film challenge, and uh, we will be speaking with. Uh, certain uh producers that entered the uh competition and we'll be watching your stories and having conversations about it i will leave the links uh with the descriptions with lou and the stream and everything uh so be on the lookout for it um and what it is is you got you got basically five minutes five to ten minutes i believe to tell your black story that you may have in court uh, you may have been a part of a racist incident, whether it's you yourself or you witnessed it with somebody else, you get to sh share that story and then you also get to share your perspective and how it may have impacted your life. Uh, an easy one for me is going back to Missouri again, uh, talking about fraternities. I joined a fraternity, well, I pledged for a fraternity and then um, they were a predominantly white fraternity. At the time, I had black fraternities that wanted me to join and they lived a different lifestyle. Like you had the pretty boys on this side, you had, you know, the thugs on this side, not thugs, that, that, that's, that's wrong. Fraternities are not thugs, but you had the, let's just say the cool kids on the other side. And me, I'm the dork of the, like, I consider myself like a nerdy guy. So I went with the nerdy fraternity, right? And they're predominantly white. And I kind of felt like there were guys in that fraternity that I thought I could trust, that I thought I was cool with, and I could call my brothers. And that's what a fraternity is. It's like you you guys you guys are locked in as brothers through this fraternity for the rest of your lives. And this is how you guys will stay connected to each other. So I thought this would be cool. But I was always iffy about it because, like, Lou, I play football. I play basketball. Like, that was my fraternity. I was just known just for that. Like, I didn't need to do anything else. And I didn't really want a fraternity in the first place. I just kind of got – I went into it kind of with guilt just because of some other friends that I knew in it. Until it came time to do the final, the final part of the pledge. Now, I also, I know I have a little intel from living with uh, some guys in, in different fraternities. I know what goes on in the fraternities, right? They all are non-hazing fraternities, right? But I understand what goes on under underneath the surface. So that's why I knew going with this particular fraternity, I knew exactly what I was going to go through. And it was going to be basically harmless. So um, I did. And then all of a sudden, Mike Brown happened. Hmm. So Florissant is like, a, like an hour and a half away from Canton, Missouri. So it's pretty close uh, and, you know, it set the world on fire and people that were involved that lived in that neighborhood were right there at Culver Stockton. We're watching everything on the news. We heard when the, you know, when they were going to uh, charge the uh, the officer for the shooting and, and, and all hell broke loose. Like, you know, so I was very, very close to all of that. On the last day of the pledge, I looked at these guys and said, you know, what if I was in that position, what would you guys do? And they failed that. They failed me on that. They couldn't, they couldn't give me a straight answer. They could, they, they, you know, you know when somebody's dodging around the point, you know when somebody's pulling the, uh, the old. Um, you're my friend. You're black. I can't be racist. Yeah, you, you're my friend. I'm black. I can't be racist. But if you were in that situation, I was a cop, or you were in that situation. What would I do? Oh, I don't know, man. A guy that size, six feet, this, and you know he's two hundred something pounds, and I don't he know. He might have that. stolen some blunts. Right. And then people try to say, well, to me, that wouldn't happen to you. You're educated, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, Mike Brown wasn't an idiot. 
Like he just, he, he might've smoked, but like what white person that been to college hadn't smoked. So like, what are you guys really trying to say about that? Like just saying that to me is racist. Like saying that I'm intelligent. What about the rest of my brothers that are out there? They're, what are you saying about them? So they just failed that. And I, and then that's the day that I decided, nope, no fraternity for me. I'm just gonna graduate and do my thing. So that's an example. If you can, you can tell, you can share that kind of story. All that we ask is that you have a setup similar to what I'm doing right now or to what you are doing right now, Lou, like you have a nice little setup where you can hear everything clear. You know, you got enough little, uh, you got enough set design with all the cool stuff you got in the background. It's not just a white wall. Me, I'm just using, I'm just going with the, uh, the black backdrop, something like that and go ahead and share your story. And we want to make sure that your story is heard on all of our platforms on social media and we'll be streaming it, streaming it live. Film Consortium is now uh, not only sponsored by KPBS, but also Panasonic Lumix uh, and the San Diego Airport. So uh, a lot of big sponsors to try and get the word out. Uh, so I hope you guys tune in on uh, February 3rd. <clears throat> well, you know, hey, man, tell Panasonic they can go ahead and shoot some of that Lumix gear my way because we leave that Lumix life around here to Amberito. Panasonic, Panasonic for life. Got the G2s. I got the F50s now. So, yep. We I got, the, I got the G2 back there. We got the G2, GH4, GH5. We got all the Gs in this house. Uh, thanks for stopping by. Mr. Kurt says, love this guy. Thank you for stopping in, Kurt. Loyal listener, follower, filmmaker, musician, overall good guy. Um, so, yeah. So, if you have a story how, you know, racism or systemic racism or, you know, uh, something has failed you or where you felt a certain type of way, I guess, in a moment and, and something that's stuck with you. I think any minority black or brown uh, has that. I mean, I remember driving through Alabama, getting out the car. My mom is in the car. I go out to, to into this Piggly Wiggly or whatever the 7-Eleven gas station was there. And I just remember walking into this gas station and the entire place stopped with all these white people in there just turned and then just looked at me and it was just dead silent as I walked to the register and I was just like, can I get $20 on pump one? And I was just like, bleep, 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 bleep. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I, I, I definitely got a, uh, you ain't from around here. Are you boy feel from, from, from that one. Right. Yeah. But it's not my place or not my time right now to tell that story. But if it's, it's a similar, but if you have a similar situation to what I've talked about or what you've talked about, obviously, I don't think that there is a black or brown person in this country that has not been either followed, followed around the store or been looked at a different, a, a different way or have been followed while you were doing nothing wrong, while you were driving down the street to where you just got paranoid because those, you know, there's not even lights behind you. There's just, it's just, you know, it's just that, that vehicle behind you. And you're just like, I know I'm not doing anything wrong. I know I ain't doing shit, but I'm still, I'm still scared. I'm, I, my, my heartbeat is still going a little bit faster than normal. I'm still double checking my speed. I'm lowering my radio. I'm hiding my weed, uh, but uh, myself, not everybody. Uh, and, and it definitely, it definitely is something that, 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 that black and brown people can relate to. And I, and I, and I, and I kind of made a post, um, you know, when, when, when it seemed like every other weeks, uh, cops were killing somebody or, you know, you know, Castile, uh, you know, Brown and Tamir Rice, um, dude that was jogging right now um like every yesterday like what was it they released a video of like 17 cops in like rochester that were fucking they pepper sprayed a nine-year-old girl uh you know to get her in the back of a police car so you know when i when i posted something a long time ago it was it was something that brown people have always known mexican latinos have always known which is that you know, you might be hated, but at least you're not black because every girl, every white girl, Chinese girl I ever dated, I was like, does your parent know that you're dating a Colombian guy or how's your parent with, how's your parent with Latinos? How's your dad feel about Mexicans? How's your dad feel about Colombians? And they're like, and that's the phrase they say, at least you're not black. And, 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 and that's something that stood with me, stuck with me my entire life. 
because there's never anything there's never there's never there, there because it's a it's a it's a sad but true statement right <laughs> I on that and you know you know what I was just going to talk to you about uh desensitization the mind we I get desensitized to all these things that you're talking about I walk through my day so used to this stuff that I'm just going through the motions I I should be angry and posting about stuff all the time I'm like, this for, it's just nothing new anymore. And I go through the motions sometimes. The stores that you're talking about, I got, you know, I, I live in Body of Logan, right? I live in a big Mexican community and there's a DD's discount in like two thrift stores and a, 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 a Manolo uh, has a little taco shop out of the grocery store. And I'll go into the, uh, I'll go into the clothing, one of the clothing thrift shops and I'll get that same treatment. You know, people pretending like they're folding clothes. You know exactly what's going on. And I'm like, yeah, I've, I've seen this since I was 10 years old, but like I'm in a space now where I'm like, I probably make more money than the person that's watching me anyway. Like, I don't care, like whatever. Whereas for some people, it's different. Some people, it still hits a nerve with some people. It's still like, what the hell are you doing? You've been following me for five minutes type of thing. So yeah, and the stuff that you, like you saying what you said about the, the women that you dated was still kind of shocking to me because like, I heard this a lot in Missouri, but in Cali and maybe you've been in other places, New York and whatnot, I didn't know it was it was like that in those places. I thought it was just predominantly white places they say this, but yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, and I think that there's a lot of people that fall back on that thing where it's like, you know, I grew up in New York, I grew up in Queens. Like I said, like I, me and you have had this conversation before yeah. offline, which is that I, I grew up with the N-word just being another way to say homie. Yeah. Just being a, a, that uh, it had zero, zero racial connotation yeah. when, for, 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 for 15 years uh, as I grew up. White people said it, Chinese people said it, Dominican people said it, black people said it, everybody said it. But you came out to California and it was still used, it was still used, but the races weren't as mixed as they were in Queens, you know? Uh, and I think that 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 stems a lot from the penal system and from the races that where me the Mexicans will, will mix with the white people, uh, but they won't mix with with black people. And, and unfortunately... The white people, the white gangs and the Mexican gangs get along because they both don't like the black gangs. But the Mexican gangs can't really have to realize that it's just it's just a level of hatred. They just happen to not hate you as much as they hate black people. So yeah. that's kind of where that where that comes from, where 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 we where I think that during this time frame, people are realizing that there's different levels of privilege and Mexican even never hate us. Huh? Mexican gangs should never hate us. They make way more money than us. Yeah, but 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 I think it's like uh it's a it's a it's a place of entitlement even within the ranks of the disenfranchised. So which is it's it's kind of like uh, is it a race to the bottom? I don't know. But but it is funny, it is interesting that that there's different dynamic on the West Coast. And when I came out here and and during the time, even though I lived my life as somebody who was comfortable saying words like that, because I think that 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 even if you heard me say something like that, I think it should be more about the intent than the actual language. If I'm thinking about it personally. Right. I think that the people that know me enough should know that if I use a word that I can use a word and you can still know that I'm not racist. But unfortunately. That's not my call to make. Yeah. You know, so so I have to put myself in a position where even though I say, well, I've been saying it for, you know, I, I get to say because Ja Rule told me I could say it, you know, like 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 J-Lo, right? Ja, uh, or like, you know, Big Pun or something like that, um, because Puerto Ricans and Dominicans in New York get to say it. But I'm like, all right, well, I'm a Colombian living in San Diego. That doesn't necessarily give me that same license. So. We does might. it inc does it inconvenience somebody's lifestyle? Does it inconvenience who I am? To the to the to the most minimal degree, you could say like, "Hey, man, I wish I could say that," you know, like, but in in a different way. But it doesn't matter, right? Is that kind of like? <laughs> yeah, what it is, what it is, Lou, is it's black people coming together, and we have to understand ourselves before we can try to understand anybody else. Like right now, you know, trying to start my own, you know, get my own LLC started, going into business, 
you know, people like myself, Kenny Jenkins, you know, with KDJ Productions, all the things that he does, Twitch and all that. We got to learn to own ourselves and be our own pioneers and entrepreneurs. And that's a big thing now. And more and more of us are doing so now. And we have to set the standard. And if we're ever going to really come down on other people for using that word, well, we need to set, set the appropriate standard. And right now, as the way the standard is right now, you have a valid point. It really should be about more intention because sometimes as black people, we weaponize that against other people sometimes just because just because we might be feeling bad that day and you like i'm sitting here literally you're teaching me poker or something like that we're playing fifa and he'd be like nigga you just beat me by three goals like bro i know we cool bro but don't mean you could be saying <laughs> i don't only be getting mad at you because some other shit happened to me that day and i i got a ticket to take some anger out on you that thing ha happens with black people sometimes yeah. the is definitely true because what it is with the n-word is basically as uh, a lot of strong black women would say, and the strength is in our women, by the way, as black people. I hate to say that. I know a lot of guys get mad. I don't give a damn. Um, they'll say, hey, you know, it's not, you know, it's about what you answer to. A lot of times when the, the N-word is bad is when somebody's calling you out of your name. That's what it really is. If you're saying, oh, nigga, that weed was bomb. Boy, I was fucked up. How am I really going to get mad at you for that? But if you, see, if you say uh, something like, Nigga, when you gonna edit my movie? I'm gonna be like, <laughs> I'm like, okay, I'm gonna I'm I'm edit your movie before someone meets you <laughs> before I edit anything. And we're gonna have a long conversation or maybe a short one. I don't know until I get there type of thing. I'm gonna take offense to that because you're calling me out of my name. You don't even have to give me a direction. You just look at me and, and you call me out of my name and look me dead in my eyes. I, I know what it means. I think we, you, we said, you said to me offline, Lou, that like, you know, there's certain things that you can't take. Like, I can't just call you a piece of shit, right? Like, that's a standard you have. And, and I respect that standard, you know? So uh, if I say you piece of shit, I understand that if I'm going to do it, I'm not going to call you out of your name. I know I suck at beer pong. And we play beer pong at your house. Like, oh, you piece of shit. I can't believe you beat me in that game. That's it. And then I'm not going to be like, Luke, you fucking cheat, you little fat piece of shit. Like, I know right there I'm, I'm, I'm crossing your standard that you already told me you've already set. So it is a lot about intentions and it is about um, us as black people really setting the standard. We're setting it higher, but we haven't set the bar high to the point where we all as a whole can uphold a standard that can alleviate and eliminate the use of the N-word. But we're getting there, though. So that's what it is. All right. You're sitting in the back of a bar, karaoke bar, right? Mm hmm. White girl gets on the microphone. Start singing like Jigga, <laughs> like like she just goes full on with it. Like, what's your reaction? Uh, my reaction is the first thing is she better know where the exit door is, because mm. um sometimes you got to remember when you're in a bar, people are drinking. And remember when I said weaponizing weaponizing the word, black people will weaponize it sometimes. You don't know what some of these people that are drinking are going through in a bar. You know, there could be a bad breakup. There could have been a fight. Somebody could have said something derogatory already. And then they hear you. And now they got it. They got it. They feel like they got a ticket to take some rage out on you. Yeah. On the other end, as a black person, we know the uh, the Jig of My Nigga song was a classic. And we yeah. all enjoyed that song. And as a black man watching a white girl sing it, we might have our intentions of what we might want to say to that person later. And it might not be anything bad. It might be like, damn, girl, you killed that song. What's up with what you doing later type of thing. Who was it that brought the girl on stage to sing and then she just started, like, um, was that a uh, dude from L.A.? Uh, you know what I'm talking about? Take a bunch of Filipinos to the drive-in. Oh, uh, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Um, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, Kendrick, 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 Kendrick. I think it was Kendrick that brought a, a, a girl on stage and he, she started rapping along, but she was saying the word and he was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Now, part of part of part of it is you got this girl that's vibing. She's probably drunk or high at the concert. You bring her up. She's a fan of Kendrick. When she's in her car, she hits that hard R like nobody's listening. Right. Mm -hmm. But you bring her on stage and then it becomes and then and and then it becomes a problem. Right. There's a there's 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 a little bit of of right. There's a little bit of layers to that. Yeah, you expect a girl to censor herself intoxicated while she's up on stage having a moment of her life. Right. She's in the moment. She feels like she has validation because you brought her up there. There's no way you get up on stage with somebody like that and you try to censor yourself between you barely know the words anyway, you know, and then 
you do that. But at the same time, you have to be consciously aware of where you're at too, as, as the individual. So like you said, it works on, it, it goes on both sides. Yeah. Kendrick Lamar. Thank you. Uh, the white boy watching with the, with the word. <laughs> okay, Kurt. Chris Rock made a joke about this. He was like, you know, you can, you know, you can get away with the, the nigger word, right? Like, you 1202 know, you, on a Thursday, the day before Christmas. Yeah. Like, uh, like, uh, you know, fuck me harder, nigger. Like right. that, that, you know, it, you know, there, that that's happened already. Like that's history. Nobody's talking about this on, but that's happened already enough times, right? That and then they've gotten away with it every single time, right? You do it in a in a moment of passion like that, yeah, you get away with it. So, I called Fat Joe and and ja Ru and they said I had a pass on karaoke, so I'm cool. Just FYI, <laughs> no, no, because you can't get on there. You know, like one of my favorite Tupac songs is that rather be N I G G A. You know, like like that's a fucking classic fucking song. It has and I don't think it necessarily in that concept has something to do with race, but you gotta be aware of the time that you're living in. And if it inconveniences you, then when you're singing the song, just leave silence where the word is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. I think that's the I think that's the better move than like saying like ninja or or you know or something else right that's always the better just don't say the word don't replace it don't throw in n-word you know like if you're if the it, you, the music is there and obviously i think it's it's almost like this um boastful thing it was like well i appreciate the music i love it i i got the album i know all the words i know and like i said if you're on the 805 in traffic and you're in your car by yourself you know, you might feel free, but you got to understand the mixed company that you might be in, what everybody's going through. And it doesn't fucking matter how you feel about the word now. It doesn't fucking matter how you feel about it because it's not your decision to make. Yeah, that's the last layer on that topic is trying to self-validate. That that's the That's the last part of it. And it's like when you're in a room, like you said, in a bar, you don't know who's exactly who's in there. So you take your precaution. And like you said, don't say the word. Or the other thing you can do is wait to be validated. Or you can ask. You can literally ask. Hey, if I say this word, are y'all going to get offended? Hell yeah. Well, you know where to step. If I say this word, are you going to get offended? Hell no, white girl. You got some big titties, girl. Go ahead and sing that. Like, you know what I mean? Like, like and, then you, and then you go ahead. But you try to self-validate. It's never going to be accepted by us. And most of the times it's pretty bad anyway. <laughs> like we're not, we're just not trying to hear it. You, we, if we validate you, fine. But in, if you're iffy about it, anytime you're iffy and you don't know, don't say it. As a matter of fact, the only time I would ever feel comfortable saying it is around black people that I already know and that 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 sort of know my heart as opposed to no language. You know what I mean? Like, because you know, like I said, growing up my entire life, you know, Lou, you're my that's my, you know, you, you, you know, blah, blah, blah. Like it just, it just, it didn't, it didn't, it, it, it meant something else than black person. It meant homie. It meant, uh, you know, my peoples, it just meant something. But like I said, it's, it, it's, it's more, and I know I keep beating this point. It's more like nobody cares how, how that, that it, nobody cares that it affects you. Yeah. Nobody gives a fuck that you're like, but I'm, I'm not saying it in a bad way. Nobody cares. Whatever your reasoning is, and this is something that I tell myself, nobody cares that it that it inconveniences you or that you feel so a way that you that you should be able to say it because you're not a mean person. It doesn't fucking matter at the end of the day. It's a new day. We're trying to correct shit that's been going on for fucking thousands of years. You know, we're trying to fucking, you know, help our brothers move up in the fucking world. So, you know, whether you're singing karaoke or or, or, or you're at a fucking Friendsgiving and you feel like you should be able to, to call somebody out and say something like that, it just, it doesn't matter, right? Absolutely. Absolutely, man. Just, you, you don't need to try and validate yourself. Understand what it is and just, and just fucking accept it. <laughs> accept right. it. I'm no, act like you don't know, because you know what it is. I think a lot of people try to act like, oh, I didn't know. Yes, you did. You, you know. Did. <laughs> you know, you just have never been called out about it. In your circle of friends, you guys use it, and nobody's ever told you, hey, man, you should really 
Like, hey, like if you have if you have if you are a non-black person and you hear it being said around a group of non-black friends, you should feel comfortable calling out your friend and see like, hey, man, would you say that shit if uh, Dimitri was here <laughs> or if fucking Kenny or Brian was here? Right. Would you would you feel that what would you what would you say in 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 that situation like if you're not gonna if you're not gonna ball out and if you're not gonna if you're not gonna be fat Joe about it and just be like own it I don't know if you want to go like Takashi six nine or or other like modern like uh, Latino Puerto Rican right at Fat Joe you had it right, right yeah Fat Joe owned it in a certain way like he's like Fat Joe has war scars when you got a man that has war scars and is down to go to war. You gotta, you 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 gotta, you're gonna, you're gonna wind up validating that man, because you're not gonna, because you're not gonna go as far as he'll go. And he's a but, nice guy now. He wasn't always that way. He's a very peaceful man, but he still got those war scars, and he can go back into that mind state at any given moment. You gotta respect that too. Yeah, and, yeah. I was thinking, I was thinking, big pun. I was gonna say, big pun's dead, but Fat Joe's still around. Yeah, big pun has the, the real scars, right? His story is like, whoa. But Fat Joe was came, but Fat Joe came from that too. Like, oh, you know the big, the big, the big pun song that I'm that I'm that I'm talking about though. Uh, that could not be. I don't know if he was released today. Um, I don't think that it's kind of like an underground short track on one of his first albums. But but uh, it wouldn't it wouldn't it wouldn't get played today. It wouldn't get that played. Okay. Um, you know what I'm talking about though, right? Yeah, there's, there's, there, there's, yeah. I mean, even when he was doing some of his underground stuff, like, yeah, he, he had a lot of them. And, um, but again, it's still with those guys, with guys who are war bound, it's a little different with them. Like, you, you give them a little bit more space because you understand, like, if, if Big Pun was, in, what would you say to him then? You know, and, and it's kind of like that, knowing exactly where he comes from, his, his story is out there. And, because yeah, I, f- I feel like there's like a certain subculture in New York that is that like ninety two to like ninety eight hip hop movement that that sort of gets grandfathered in, and a lot of people that came up in that in that era yeah. that was a little bit afterwards they grew up on it and they just sort of felt and that expanded across certain parts of the country, but but like I said, I mean you have to be cognizant of the times that you're living in. So you know. So, like I said, to people that 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 still feel that it should be about your intent instead of the word that you use, I understand that, but it doesn't matter. That's just that's just the basic of it. Oh, but really, in reality, yeah. At the end of the day, it comes back to exactly what you said. That really, it really does come back to that, though. In the end, C. Ra C. Robles checking in. Says Big Chief in green. He is, yes, we are. Two and Burrito crew in the house. How you doing? And slave my vegetables when I was dating Russia, a Sudanese woman. Humble brag. Uh, she had no idea about the history of America and slavery until she went to college. I guess they don't teach that in Africa, which, you know, why would you? I guess. I mean, it's kind of like, I don't know. I guess. I don't know. I, I, that's an educational choice. It's, it's, the thing is, we're going, to, we're going to learn it one way or another, whether we want to or not. It doesn't have to be in school. So it doesn't need to be taught because you're going to learn it, number one. But in American school, they make sure you know it. You will not get out of school without learning it. You know, uh, you know, we don't we don't talk about you know you you have to go on Netflix to hear about what the United States did with the Contra during the crack era. But you know, you know, it took years for that to come out. But you know, slavery that's going to be day one of your uh, social studies class in elementary school and day one of any kind of history class you take at the collegiate level. So yeah. Well, I mean, uh, I appreciate the fact that that, that we can have like uh, an open discussion about that because I think a lot of times people are are scared to broach the topic or to talk about it in in, a, in an interesting way. Yeah, in a story, story that goes directly to everything that we just talked about. Uh, I have a friend; his nickname is Hooks. He's a Hispanic dude. I go to Adams uh, Park, Thirty Ninth Street, and I go and play uh, basketball with these Hispanic guys. You know, it's a kind of a lower level competition. From what I from what I come from, however, we play hard and we play rough. There's you know hard fouls and stuff like that, but we have a good time. We get some beers out. And we're we're cool. So this guy, but he, my friend Hooks was at the park by himself, and you know when somebody's going through something in their life and they kind of have that I don't give a fuck attitude and they kind of have like a death wish because of whatever's going on. Now he's drunk as all hell and he's not saying anything about what's going on. He keeps uttering out these words. What the fuck you going to do about it, nigga? You ain't going to do shit anyway. You're not going to do shit anyway. He's not talking to anybody, Lou, but like 
there's enough black people around to hear what he's saying and he's not going to stop and and he got he got a pass for a, a good 45 minutes of saying this and i'm looking at him like this is my friend but he needs to stop but i'm thinking he's going to stop because people are hearing and they're turning a blind eye to it like he's just drunk let him do his thing after 45 minutes, the temperament is down. The temperament's gone at this point. Now people are getting up out of their chairs and they're like approaching this man. You know, some guys, some some black guys are playing some spades, talking shit. They got a little, they got a little party going on. They might have a little weed, a little drink, whatever, having a good time in the park. And they're like, okay, that's enough now. And now they're getting up. So, so now you know, I'm just shooting the ball by myself after a nice little workout. And I say, yo, hooks, like, shut up, man. Like, there's people in the park. Like, what are you doing? He's not listening to me at this point. And you know, long story short, now individuals are coming after him and they're ready to fight. Um, and uh, there specifically were, uh, there were three black guys and then there was a fourth black guy that wasn't in any crew or clique. He was just like a military guy. But, you know, even though he was a smaller individual, he took all, he all of a sudden he takes off his shirt and he's got the little muscles like he's built and all of that kind of stuff. And he's like, man, I ain't, I ain't cool with all that nigga shit, bro. Fuck is wrong with you. Takes off the shirt. You know, black, we like to flex and walk towards you when we about to fight like a world star war cry. He's doing that. You know what I'm saying? And then um, he's ready for war. Now, my big black ass, I'm literally over here guarding this man. Now, in my mind, even as a even, even as a martial art practitioner, I'm going to save your life. I'm not going to fight for you. Like, I am not throwing one strike in this because, like, you did bring this shit on yourself. But I but I believe in preserving life. I don't believe in ignorant violence. That's not going to, and not to mention at that time, there was still a police station right by that park, like literally adjacent to the park. And I'm trying to tell these black guys as they're getting upset and acting like they want to fight. I'm like, you know, you guys going to be the ones in prison. If you guys go through with this, like when the cops get here, you guys get in trouble. He might get something happen. Something might happen to uh, the Mexican man too, but you guys know what's going on here. Like, you know, what can end up happening to you guys? Why put you guys themselves? in this kind of predicament they didn't hear a damn thing they said lou they could care less it was on luckily these guys don't really know how to fight that well but they're still you know acting like goons they're running up on them and at some point uh my my friend he goes down like the black guy's getting mad he's pushing on him and i'm trying to shield him and he goes to the floor i'm like chill trying to hold him back and he's like yo nigga why are you holding me like, out of all the people that should be holding me back right now, I'm like, why are you holding me? I'm like, yo, that's my friend. He's a fucking idiot. I'm going to deal with his ass. But, like, like back up. Like, he's, he's a fucking idiot, right? We, I, He gets up off the ground. He's still kind of running his mouth. Like, he's still saying the same stupid words. He's still saying nigga. So now the, the some of the African crew, it's three-man African crew now, or they got hands up. My boy is drunk. He throws the drunkest, tel most telegraph overhand right I've ever seen. Been there. Now he gets he gets he gets his jaw tipped. The other guy that's fighting him is not that good either. But you know he's at least coherent enough to locate the concu concussive part of the area and hits the chin and gets the knockdown. Right? He's not unconscious. He's just on the ground. And okay, at this point, I'm getting in front of his body. I'm spreading out and I'm still holding guys back. Chill, chill, chill. It's over. Like you knocked him down. I think I tried to lie. You knocked him out. He's not out. But um, you knocked him out. It's over. It's over, like, leave him alone, chill. And I still can hear black guys like, why are you holding us back? Why are you holding us back? What the fuck is you doing? So um, after that, um, one guy said, you need a backup because you ain't doing shit right now. We're trying to take off your Mexican friend. Now, in this moment, Lou, I can speak up and say some shit. But at that moment, I actually just fucking backed up. But I trusted that he was saying back off as if we're gonna we're gonna let him go, but we want you to back up first and then we'll let him go type of thing. So I did, and I'm watching to see if they're gonna do anything else. They start to back up. Now, after my boy got his jaw rocked, he uh after he got his chin rocked, those words weren't coming out no more. Like he got his chin rocked, you're like, okay, obviously this is real now. And uh he finally shut the fuck up. And then um the guys they left. And I can hear the skinniest dude at, out, the, out of the African pack, like, man, I was about to sleep this motherfucker. That big nigga wouldn't hold me back. Like, I can hear that shit. And I'm, you know, uh, then all his friends that I know, they all come to the park and they all trying to, like, call people and all this. You know, super late, way after the fact. Cops get there asking questions. You know, they say my boy Hook snitched on everybody. It, it, it was whatever. And then it was like, I was upset, not because of Hook's. This is a park I grew up in. 
Like I need, I like to come here and play ball. Like I still go even this morning, getting up at five in the morning, go running over there. Like I love this place. It's a part of my life. I don't care where I'm at. I'm probably going to come back to this park and work out. And now I got to worry about Mexicans and, 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 and Africans and, and blacks fighting each other, duking out in the park. Is that what I got to worry about? Uh, and it died out. It died out. And then a uh, Mexican dude, my boy hooks, he came back. So, yo, man, hey, thank you, man. Like, thank you for uh, helping me out. And I was like, yeah, don't do that shit again. His brother was with him, and his brother tried to challenge me to a fight. And this dude is pint size, five foot six, 140 pounds. Like, hey, bro, you trying to mess with my brother? Well, guess what? You got a problem with me. And I'm like, you're yeah, a little late. This was a week ago. Uh, you're a little late. But, you know, all right, whatever. I'll give you your respect anyway. But, like, remember, just remember, I'm the one that saved your friend's life. I hope you remember that, you know. And um, we went on from there. The other homies was like, yo, no, we talked to Hooks about that shit. We're not with it. We're not trying to go up against the Africans. We talked to him like that was some stupid shit. He's not going to do that no more. And, um, you know, and that was the end of the story, man. And, you know, for me, I even with the word, even with, you know, people trying to self-validate themselves when they shouldn't, like like you already talked about. Uh, I, I love life and I want to preserve life. Like, I don't want to see nobody get their life taken. If the guns come out, my fat ass turns into a ghost. This peak shirt turns into Kirby if the guns come out. You know what I'm saying? I'm out but like as long as like we're throwing fists and trying to throw you know uh throw fists and, and chairs and things like that no like it's not worth it's not worth all like guru said although he used the n-word whether you die or kill or whether you die or kill him it's another brother dead although i know you'll never get that through your head um so you know you don't want to you don't want to be there when the guns come out that that is for true i was i was trying to equate it to how a latino or mexican feels when somebody says beaner or spick honestly man i could count the number the number of times somebody has thrown that word at me in my life on one hand it's not nearly as predominant uh, uh an insult as as beaner which seems more of a benign sort of like it's like a pg-13 race racism almost like a beaner um you know spick doesn't get really thrown around as much but then but then mexicans and latinos don't really use that as a term that they want to take power of again like the n-word because it wasn't systematically used to oppress and to demean for several hundred years um you know so i think that's when people try to to to, to, to raise those parallels they they don't equate because even though you can say, well, that's what spick means. It's no, no, spick is, is, is short for Hispanic. It's kind of derogatory, but it's hard to say. I think racists get real pleasure out of that hard R. You know what I mean? So it's completely different, right? Yeah. And, you know, it's funny because you're talking about the Mexicans. It's like we we don't even like if we want to like be derogatory with you guys, We've, we've struggled to find a word to like really get underneath your guys' skin because like we've tried Beaner before and it, it is like, hey, fuck you, but it's not like a big deal. Like it's kind of like, so you know what we came up with? Most likely we came up with this, the Mexican niggas. Like that's what we wind up saying in the end. Like, like Mexican niggas. Well, well, that was the joke. That was a, the joke in, in, during the Iraqi war. It's like, what are we going to call them derogatory and then just call them sand? n-word you know what i mean like that's 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 they're like let's just go with that it's easy yeah we'll call them sand and, and 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 throw our favorite word behind it and that's what that's how we'll refer to them yeah yeah man yeah <laughs> uh what is what what dave Chappelle so oh, that racism is so magnif you know chef's kid sometimes the racism is so 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 advanced and so ingrained that it's crazy um so the Black Lives Matter. So obviously, man, we 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 saw, we 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 branched out into like the the race topic, which which I understand, and and I thought it was you know it's 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 cool that we get to, you know, some people will use that boondocks defense where it's around you all that time, uh, you know, what I'm talking about from the uh, mm -hmm. that 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 you know is you gonna give it back, um, but the but the overall factor is be aware of your time, like you said, you know. It depends on, on the company. It depends on your intent. Yes. But when in doubt, leave it out. Uh, karaoke <laughs> or whatever. You can you can sing the song. Um, the So uh, any of these things that we've talked about, 
could be, like I said, things that have happened to, to people of color for, for the last several years. Um, any of these could be a story, a morsel, something that you could present um, to sort of add to your oral history or to just sort of put it out there. Um, because the more you put out stories like this, the more people that might be afraid to tell their story say, yeah, something similar like that happened to me. And, and when you see this happening more and more, you know, there is a segment of the right wing sort of population that doesn't accept gay, lesbian uh, marriage until they have a gay son right or a lesbian daughter or a trans son or daughter right there's there's a lot of people that will not open themselves up to, or that you know you can even say that don't take covid seriously until it affects them directly people oftentimes have to be forced by it affecting them to affect certain things so if you put your story out there you are enabling somebody else to piggyback off of you and be more confident, feel more confident in telling their story. And the more stories that are told, the more people that didn't know those things were happening will open up their eyes. Do you think there's a truth to that? Uh, absolutely. You know, uh, going a little off topic, you know, Bruce Lee was the first person that said, you know, it's not Chinese martial arts, it's not Kung Fu, it's not kickboxing, it's not none of that. You learn every martial art that you can take from the martial arts that works for you and disregard the stuff that doesn't work for you. And the, the correlation there is get all the knowledge that you can obtain from these stories so you can gather a bit a better perspective on, and get to know us a little bit better. Cause all these are different in certain ways. And you know, the black lives matter film competition, has all races in it. It's not limited to black people. So you're going to have white people telling, I've already heard a few white people tell some very interesting stories, like stories that start with driving in a car and listening to Busta Rhymes and how that's a great thing to do when you're stressed out. Like that was crazy, right? Because I know me and you listen to Busta, you don't think some white girl would, be, you know, but that's a thing. And then, you know, you learn about uh, these stories and you start to, you need these other stories that are not stereotypical, that are real life stories, not something that's in the media, social media, uh, to, to learn from and gain a proper perspective and understand um, the, the issues that have been a part of our history and how we can take those issues and start to work on those for a better future for us all. So that's why it's important to take all the information in. We do have a panel of judges. So not exactly every single story is gonna to be told. Every single story is not going to make it. We will disregard those who we feel are, um, uh, not of the community guidelines, uh, you know, so, um, but most of these stories will be told. And, you know, you, the, the whole point is not only do people that are non-minorities hear something that they've never heard before, us as minorities, we hear something that we've never heard before. And now we're gaining more perspective into the other minds of, of other races as well. So it's, it's for all of us to learn and it's done on a platform where you don't have to risk uh, high scrutiny and judgment. And, and that's what we want to provide to have these better conversations. So this this doesn't necessarily be have to be black voices. This could be right. a, a non-black voice that has been caught up in the moment and has realized something about either their privilege or their position of, of, of opportunity or have gone or seen their friends go through something like this, right? Absolutely. Yep. Uh, absolutely. Um, so how can people get involved? How do, how do people submit? What's, what's the process? Uh, all you have to do is go to filmconsortium.com. Uh, they always have, they're always updating their events and they will take you to uh, film freeway where you can go ahead and register and sign up. It's really, and it's really that easy on filmconsortium.com. But if you, you can, you should also be able to look for it if it's on film freeway and film freeway, right? If you look for black okay. uh, BLM film okay. time. Absolutely. You can you can look up Black Lives Matter um, uh, challenge on Film Freeway. Look up Film Consortium on free on Film Freeway um, and, and they will uh, it'll it'll take you right there. And then are these all like uh, storytelling? Can you do like spoken word? Is it what what are there any limits to how you tell the story? 
um, you can do it. Uh, you can do it through cinema. You can do it through um, uh, a, a normal, like like you said, just a normal, just telling a story the exactly the way I'm doing it right now. Like with the black, that's why I'm purposely doing this with the black, 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 that, uh, <laughs> I'm doing this with the black backdrop uh, with the lighting. You know, you can do it this way. You can you can tell a short story if you want to. It, you can literally do both as long as it's under the time limit and the judges feel like it's appropriate to the culture and you're giving us a proper perspective on something. Uh, we're we're gonna accept it. So it, it it is it is kind it is kind of broad as long as you stick to what the the subject is. <clears throat> Okay, because when I first saw it, I felt that it was like, hey, if you are a black filmmaker and you have a, a film that sort of deals with racial issues, you can submit it to this and put it on. And that's how, uh, it, started, how it started. Okay, but then you guys have expanded to be able to to expand it so that more, 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 more types of storytelling, whether it's poetic, whether it's a short story, whether it's spoken word, where it's a beat poem. Yeah. I walked into the room. Yeah. Yeah, we want you to get- <laughs> We want you to be able to sit down and, and literally have a conversation and, and tell your story. Just What's the time limit. Yeah, uh, w- uh, w- within a time limit because we uh, we also understood when we were first talking about when the board first started talking about this is like, you know, do you really need to you know, get in contact with a filmmaker and do uh, pre production, and then uh, you know do pre production and then do a film and then do post production? Like, do you really want to go through that? Like everybody doesn't have access to that, but a lot of people have really great stories, so. Let's make it a little more broad than that. So you know, well, we'll, we'll, we'll because this because this is a, f- a film organization. We're always going to take in the uh, the cin- the cinematics as well as the uh, uh, testimonies. Can you show clips or show something that you've done and then sort of speak over it as well? Can you do kind of like a hybrid? From what I know, yes, yes. And what is the time limit? I believe it changed. I believe they said it was. 10 minutes in the beginning they might have lowered it to five so that one i'm a little iffy on but it's either five or ten minutes i'll say five and then uh, cost wise cost wise i believe the entry fee is 25 dollars. okay that's 25 bucks you get five to ten minutes um and and this is all going to be live stream so you basically jump into a zoom or jump into a stream yard you know you wait your turn they call you on you introduce yourself Bada bing, bada boom. This is my story. Thank you for your time. Adios. And then the judging is afterwards. The judging is not live, right? Right. And then uh, I believe we have a uh, Q and A session to go with that as well. After all the stories are told, and we get to have a little discussion panel about it. So, yeah. And then also the the judges as well tell their stories as well. We're also a part of it too. So, uh, so yeah. We just we, we want to get you know we want to get everybody heard and. Uh, and uh, try to gain a better perspective. And I've always had a love, hate, love, hate relationship with the consortium because of you know I've always been. Oh, really? How come you never told me? It's uh, I've always been one to to speak truth to power, and 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 I've agreed with things that they do. I think it's a great community organization. I don't necessarily believe that at all times is it moving in the direction to help filmmakers move forward. But I do think that it breeds at least a community of filmmakers. Now, whether that community is off is is going to be always a positive because I, sometimes I think community and familiarity breeds unprofessionalism. Um, is it always going to be the best thing for it? Uh, neither here, there. But I do agree that a lot of the events and the stuff that that they that they put on is is great for networking, showcasing, and getting yourself out there. Um, obviously. You know, um, I received a, uh, a film award for uh, the Diversity in Film Award a couple of years ago because, thank you, thank you, thank you, Black Power, uh, because of the fact that we've always had, and, and it was funny because we got an award for doing just what we do on a normal, everyday basis. 2 a.m. Burrito is half Black owned. Um, you know, it was funded by, you know, a Colombian guy, a Mexican girl, a Black guy, and a Chinese guy. That those are the original four of our company. And ever since then, we've had an open ethnicity policy. We've made movies with white people as leads, black people as leads, Latino people as lead. So when I got an award, I was like, this is a validation that we're doing things right. When the new Oscar rules came out, basically saying moving forward, the Oscars is going to seek to be more inclusive. We're going to demand that 30% of your cast or crew or production staff be minority women, blah, 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 this and that. And I was like, 
I literally do not have to change one thing about how I make movies in order to qualify for the Oscars because that's the way we've always done movies. But there was a lot of, there was a, not a lot, I'm not going to say a lot. There was a few local filmmakers that immediately freaked the fuck out. This is going to destroy my artistic integrity. They're, they're just, this is communism. They're making you, this is, kept an eye on who those people were. Um, but wh- how do you feel about people that freak out about having to do the literal bare minimum of adding to diversity to their, to their film teams or to their cast and crews? I feel two ways about it. The first way I feel coming from my open-minded professional realm that I live in is like, you know, we want to give people the ability to choose, right? In the Matrix, the Merovingian says, you know, choice is nothing but illusion to those with power and those without. The illusion of choice. But you take a, you take the choice away, and again, you're, you, it's like you're forcing them to act right. And this is why, Lou, in the beginning of the interview, I said, I don't give a damn, all right? Like, I don't care what your intention is, treat us right. If you cannot create because of a certain guideline, first of all, it's ignorant. Lou, you are a veteran of these all these competitions, four points, 48, whatever, the horror challenge out in Japan, wherever it's at. They all have rules that are uh, a little bit off to um, not hinder your production, but force you to be more creative. They'll be like, oh, okay, in this film in this, in this film competition, you gotta say the word automatopoeia, you have to have a dog prop, and you have to have uh, at least one, at least one uh, glitch effect, you know, going back to Paul Dredd and Fallback, one glitch effect in, in your production. And it's like, okay, how do I, I got, okay, the, the genre I pulled was, um, uh was um ensemble <laughs> you know and like how the hell like okay i'm gonna do a glitch effect in an un- ensemble and then i'm gonna say automatic pit what like how am i and then all of a sudden you see all these great these cool movies that come out right so obviously if you're doing that competition if you're doing these competitions and most of the people in san diego that's what we do for a living literally and then all of a sudden they say oh you gotta we gotta add these other set of rules that includes you putting minorities in the, in the film and now all of a sudden it's a problem that again that starts to speak to your uh, intentions once again okay. either uh do it or, sh- or or really for me on the ignorant side of me like do it or, sh- or shut the hell up because like you have to make them a leader you can make them a, i mean the thing is you, it just it just makes you think about your thing they could be your producers your your camera people you, you, sure. why why is that so hard and the thing is, like you said, people said it's affecting their creativity. If if you can't do that, you don't have creativity. You really don't. Like it, it, it's like you know, I can I can you know, we because of my relationship with people like you and Jody, I can produce anything. All I got to do is make sure there's some money into it, and be like, hey, Lou, I want to pay you to you know cast something, or maybe you know if it's just me and you just working on low on a project, we can take a, a, a all white cast and, do, and and make and make beautiful magic. We can take a a, a Mexican cash and Mexican cast mixed Asian, and we're gonna find something for everybody. You know, Kenny Jenkins included. He, he's a producer who writes. You know, he can write for anybody. So you know, it, it's not about your creativity. You're hiding behind it. You're hiding behind it because you disagree with it. And if you disagree with that, it's an obvious sign of racism. You know, it's just a very obvious sign. And honestly, you can go to hell if if, if you're saying that. Like I I have no respect for it. 100% at all. But on my sophisticated side of things, you know, you do, you should be able to at least choose and not have to be forced. But the real, the real Dimitri inside says, I don't give a damn if you guys are forced or not. Do it. And you, you can still choose. I mean, something that's a reoccurring thought on, on all my podcasts and on anything that I do for Edward Film School is at the end of the day, it's going to be, it's your film. It says written and directed by Luis Martinez, not by Joe Smith. It is my movie. It is my art. I am going to be judged by it. So I am open to, if I want to pick all Colombian, Uruguayan mixed actors because that's 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 what I am Colombian and Uruguayan and I and I say that's the only movie I want I can do that but 
but when I have, you know, when I, we did Puffy Must Die, I chose Malcolm Johns to be the lead actor because he was the perfect person for the part. And when we were doing shenanigans uh, and I was kind of picturing this in my mind, I was like, oh, that's going to be perfect for Dimitri and Jace for these two dudes. And and it, and sometimes when you're a fil- uh, an independent filmmaker, you're you're casting from from a small circle around you. And you're trying to figure out who's the best lobe. So as long as you are open to possibilities around you and you're open to 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 sort of being outside of what your initial preconception is, it shouldn't affect you. You can still make you can still make uh your Lily White movie if you want. You just don't qualify for the Oscars anymore. That's yeah. just the fucking way it's gonna be. And the thing is, the thing with me, Lou, that burns me up is they, I believe people know this. I, everything you just said, I think it's, it's, it's actual common knowledge. I don't think they're ignorant to the fact, Lou. I don't believe it. They just had it. They just had it. You think it's just, they've had it for that way so long that they just don't tell me it's the, yeah, you can, yeah, I guess a lot of those people fall under the don't tell me to wear a mask crew as well. Right. And they're like, just trust people do the right thing. But just trusting people to cast minorities hasn't worked for 100 years of cinema because it's only been like 40 years where black people have been able to play black people. You know, you had people winning Oscars for play for playing Mexicans and Indians, but they were white. <laughs> they were winning Oscars and the black people that were nominated were not allowed to go to the fucking Academy Awards. So it's not we're not that far removed from a very dark area in Hollywood where where only you know white dudes were got to play you know they were the only ones that that got to that got kind of got to come out and do their thing now it's more inclusive now let me ask you a quick question remember when uh this is the classic this is the the, the classic example that all black people talk about in the film was Denzel Washington winning the award for training day right do you know why black people were upset about that because his name was Alonzo or because he had a black, uh, a Latina girlfriend or what was it? Because the, there's two parts. The first part is usually well known is Denzel Washington's history of roles be- before playing training day. Now on one end, you could argue Denzel showed he, uh, he fully optimized, optimized his range in training day because he played a part. that was not the hero or the person that the stand up guy that he normally plays. Right. You can take that angle. But the way black people saw it was like every positive role he played from glory all the way up to there, uh, he never got anything. And he, he's been giving award winning performances for years now. The one time he plays a, a, a crooked black cop, all of a sudden, now he's worth winning an award. That was that's, what said. That's and, the Halle Berry thing, too. She had to play a, a hooker to, to win her Oscar, right? Exactly. And then on the sophisticated end of black people, we were looking at the movie that was released a couple of years previous to that. His last, his last uh, uh, starring role before that was Hurricane Carter. You know, it was a black boxer who was uh, who, who was uh, detained by police unjustly. You know, Black Lives Matter style, basically. You know, he's driving his car to white people say, a black man who who, who did this murder. Hurricane Carter says, "Oh, any any two black people will do." At the time, he's champ of the world and all of this, and they take and they take him in, and, and, and you know. And he gave an uh, award-winning performance for that, and you know that was a, a standing ovation performance. And nothing he gets, he really doesn't get, he doesn't get the nod. And then his next starring role, Crooked Cop, now you get the nod, and that that threw a lot of us as black people in a frenzy. And then and then Holly Berry as well. Yeah, it's it's why Denzel had to be crooked before he took it. I think is a line I forgot who it. Jada, because you know we both listen to New York hip hop. I know. <laughs> You know, I gotta bring out the lines, baby. I gotta, I gotta bring out the lines. That's the cool thing about us, Louis. Like, you know, I'm, I'm a straight up San Diego. And you've been around more places than I have, but we, we both listen to a lot of New York stuff. And like, All right, catch, catching up with some, with some comments here. And Slave says your dog in the background looks comfortable as fuck. There is shy girl right here. She's taking a nap. She's slamming. Uh, C, C Y threw us the L O L on, the, on something else. Uh, and Slave by Bessel said uh, he should have won from Malcolm X. Absolutely, he should have. He should have won from Malcolm X. He, he could he just, you know, he he definitely could have won from Malcolm X. Um, the February thirteenth is the live stream for the Black Lives Matter film challenge, which is not necessarily a film challenge, but it is a. Yeah, I would say it's more of a Black Lives Matter story challenge. 
open to every filmmaker locally and worldwide if you have a story that fits the category, the narrative of an, uh, something that you went through, that you witnessed, um, or that you feel um, that, that pertains to the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, go ahead and please uh, go to filmconsortium.com or go to Film Freeway and look up the Black Lives Matter Film Challenge so that you can be a part of the stream on February 13th. Tell your story. Um, $25 to submit and Dimitri is here to talk about it. Hey guys, if you guys want to be famous, you know, by, <laughs> by followers, thank you. The, t the trolls have shown up in the chat. <laughs> if you want to you made it, baby, you made it. The, the trolls are here. <laughs> All right, we're going we're gonna to get into some non life and death race stuff here with Dimitri in a second, because I do want to catch up with him. We're going to talk basketball, a little bit sports, a little bit of things here on, uh, we've, we've done an hour 15 on, on race in America and the black lives matter film challenge. So let's lighten it up a bit. Um, but, but yeah, definitely hurricane was a fantastic film. No fucking joke. Hurricane was a best, was a fantastic. I mean, Denzel's a beast, man. Like, like you, he, you could, if you could go back and take away somebody's Oscar and give it to Denzel, I, I would. You know, <laughs> we had a, we had a bit that we were gonna do called the Un Oscars, mm -hmm. where you would go back and take somebody's Oscar and give it to somebody else more deserving. So Denzel, Denzel would get one. Like, you know, like I would take away. Um, who I mean, whose Oscar could you take away? Uh, the movie Crash, which was horrible, uh, and, and give it to somebody else. Uh, you could take away uh, Martin Scorsese's uh, Oscar for uh, The Departed. Uh, Martin Scorsese getting an Oscar for The Departed when he's done a million other much better movies than that. That's a, that's another thing. Uh, Spike Lee finally winning an Oscar. When you know he he didn't win it for 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 do the right thing or for a bunch of other stuff that he did, um, you could you could you could retcon the entire Oscars history if you really wanted to get, to see who was uh, who was really deserving. Um, Side note, and I want to pick your brain on this because you're uh, a higher film guru than me. Um, I want to know your opinion. What do you feel when we talk about these Oscar, you know, screw ups? or people who shouldn't have got it and people who got it later, they always bring up paying dues. That's usually the term that gets thrown around. Oh, they, they paid their dues and then now it's their time to get one. Is it about paying Is it about paying dues or is it about the film? Like, I want to hear your perspective on that. I think my perspective on that is that the Oscars are a private organization, right? that started off with people had to be brought into it. It was like a fraternity. You had, somebody had to vouch for you. Somebody had to bring you in. You had to be a major player in Hollywood, or you had to have won an Oscar. So even if you won an Oscar in 1936, if you were alive in 1996, you could still vote for an Oscar. So it stands to reason that if it's a white industry that started off as a white industry, we're nominated more white people and more and more and more. And those people that won awards were then the ones that would watch every movie or watch every movie and nominate people that they would tend to nominate more and more of the same kind. So I don't think it's a matter of pain or do. I just think it's a matter of the judging establishment. That's why the Hollywood, Hollywood foreign press and other things sometimes differ a little bit from the Oscars. Not by much, but a little bit. So yeah. I don't believe that it's... So I think that some of these rules and stuff that have been changed and, you know, them saying, well, you don't get to keep your lifetime membership unless you stay active in the industry. We need to purge some of these voters that, that, that are like 90 years old because it could be like... You, there's movies like The Remains of the Day and it was like Oscar bait because it was a nice, easy English movie, and and all these old eighty-five-year-old people were gonna go to the little to the to the Academy movie theater or get their little screener, and they'd feel all nice and safe inside, and they'd watch the movie, you know. And there was and and they would be like, "Oh, this is the one that won the Oscar, right?" Yeah. And 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 so I I don't agree that it has to do with pain dues because. You know, we're here. You know, like like I tell about myself, I I'm I'm not an up and coming filmmaker. I get judged 
right next to every other filmmaker in the world. That's how I want it. I don't want to be judged as a, you know, like, I don't think that the pain dues thing is a realistic thread because of the fact that you're talking about a private organization. Now, if you're talking about opportunities to make and direct films, then maybe it's a little bit more apt as in you're not going to get a chance to do like I wouldn't get a chance to do transformers right now or to 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 you know unless somebody took a look at my body of work and said okay you made two features you made 15 short films you had you manage you manage actors you, you have a good comedic timing we're going to give you a shot you know and then so so I think in that essence then yeah you do have to, there do, there is a certain amount of dues pain that you have to do as a filmmaker to get to the level where you get recognized there but as far as nominations that has more to do with the body the governing body of the oscars and the people that are watching and judging the movies than it has to do with the individual um with the individual oscar if that makes sense yeah uh, thank you for shining light on that for me yeah uh, all right and my best will says good job bravo and one of the subject best actors i've ever seen in my life is angela bassett yeah of course man of course. Tell me something I don't know, Mean Gene. Angela Bassett is one of the best actors. Uh, we also lost a very major black actress within the last week. Cicely Tyson passed away. Uh, an, an icon of icons at 97. Also, side note, RIP Dustin Diamond, a.k.a. Screech from Saved by the Bell. Many a times on Saturday mornings or after school, I would watch Saved by the Bell. Um, everybody knows that. What was the the guy from uh, the 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 lead guy from Say by the Bell? Uh, Screech. Uh, well, somebody in chat will tell me. Uh, is it Mark Paul? But whoever the main character in Say by the Bell was is a sociopath. There's videos about him. He was always the bad guy. He was the horrible person. But you could always count on on whatever the B story or C story that Screech was going on was always the funny. Um, and obviously he went on to do other stuff. So it, I don't want to necessarily be like, oh, Screech, you know, but but because he obviously went on to do other stuff. And, and one of those things is obviously you don't want to be remembered for just uh, Paul. But obviously uh, RIP Dustin Diamond, a.k.a. Screech. Right. As, as, what happened? He had a ball, didn't he? He had a ball? During it, during his career. Hey, I'm 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 sure he did, man. He he. Uh, I, I don't think that there's a there's an actor alive that gets put on like a, that that gets that NBC money, and at some level isn't having a good isn't having a good time at some at some point, you know. Right. Yeah. Especially in the '90s when you were getting like 30, where you, where it was like now it's like, hey, can you give us eight episodes? Yeah. Back in the day, it was like, hey, can you give us 56 episodes because that's how many we need because this is a network show. Yeah. All right. All right. So I'm going to take a literal 35 second break here. We're going to shift gears. We're going to talk a little bit sports. We got a bracket bit for Dimitri. We're going to wrap things up. We're going to get on a little bit of a lighter tip, but we will be right back with Dimitri Green. Also, if you have your uh, your your handles, uh, put them in the private chat. That way, I can put a banner up, or if there's any links that people need for it as well, just just copy them in there, and I will put them up as a banner. So we will be right back. Big Chief Burrito, Dimitri Green, Season Two Fireside Chats. We'll be right back.
And we are back. Big Chief Burrito here in the house, live on a Monday, episode one of the new season of Fireside Chats with Big Chief Burrito. We're talking uh, about the Black Lives Matter Film Challenge, which is February 13th. Going to give it another shout out here. Um, make sure you go on filmconsortium.com, look up the Black Lives Matter Challenge, or go on Film Freeway, or on Facebook, you'll find a link, or through Dimitri's page, you can find links to submit, so that you are able to tell your story live on stream February 13th in front of a bunch of judges to compete side by side with other stories about the black experience or how it feels to be a minority or how it feels to see other minorities going through things in this current day and age. But me and Dimitri here, longtime collaborators, 2AM Burrito crew. We thank you for everybody that's watching. Make sure you leave a like on the screen, leave a comment, leave a question, whatever you like. But, um, you know, it's Super Bowl week. Side note, fireside chats on wednesday morning wednesday morning i will be doing a live stream with seven time pro bowl center for the new york jets nick mangold who anchored an offensive line that is one of the offensive lines that has a record for most consecutive games played together. They played 32 games in a row together that offensive line included nick mangold at center Hall of Famer Alan Fanica uh, at one of the at, the, at one of the tackles, the Brickishaw Ferguson at the other tackle. If you watch ESPN, um, Woody Williams, uh, one of the best offensive lines that football has seen during the Rex Ryan era, um, and he has a uh, a barbecue sauce called A seventy four. Which is a barbecue, which is what he chose to do post career. And I reached out to them on Twitter and I didn't think they were going to say yes, but they said yes. So I'm interviewing a seven time pro bowler on Wednesday morning. How you like, how you, how you like me now? Throw them bows a little bit, Dimitri. We got, we, we, we getting it. <laughs> um, so tune in for that. Make sure that you like and sub so that you get the notifications when we go live. Do you have a Super Bowl pick yet? <sighs> Uh, my pick is the Chiefs. Uh, mm. This offensive football, um, there's a part of me that I root for greatness too. So I root for Tom Brady to win just because, like, a lot of people, like, hate Tom Brady when I see him lose. I like witnessing greatness because it, it inspires me to do things great, you know. So when he was about to have the perfect season and it got ruined, I wasn't really happy. I was happy for a dude that caught the crazy pass and all that and the Giants and all that, but it was like I really – like, I want to witness it. I want to see what a perfect season looks like. That Like, that's amazing to me. And it, it didn't happen. It was cool, whatever. I'm not butthurt about it. And then, like, yeah, to see Tom Brady, like, win a champion. First of all, Kenny Jenkins actually forespoke this on a, on a, on a, uh, on one of his, um, on one of his statuses he wrote on his page. And it was, he was basically uh, making, um, he was making, he was making directions towards Trump, right? Like, talking about how he's, like, married to, uh, a model and how he wears a MAGA hat and this, that, and the other, how he's rich. Nobody can keep him down. But at the end of the day, Tom Brady might go to another Super Bowl. Like, and he literally predicted that on his, uh, on, uh, on his own. It was really cool that he did it. And now it's here. So I was like, I kind of, yeah, like I, I wouldn't mind seeing Brady win one. But if, if I have to go for a pick or I'm going to put some money on, I'm putting on. <clears throat> You got to put it on my homies. Um, yeah, low key Tom Brady is 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 a low key, high key Trump guy. So that yeah, that is also kind of digs at me a little bit. So yeah, I think I'm I'm Chiefs. <laughs> so let let's let's go Chiefs. Um, did you? Here's here's another question for you in terms of fandom, because there's a thing. Um, what? I don't know who this is. Huh. Um, here's my here's here's my question uh, on that, which is, so you're a Celtics fan, right? Not not you, but I'm saying if you're a Celtics fan, right? Uh -huh. You got these two ballers like Jason Tatum, um, and uh, the other dude, uh, Brown. That that that's been, that that's balling right here. But then there's like, well, you should trade those dudes for an established star when you if you're talking about yourself or your team do you prefer to root for like the players that your team has developed or or would you because i mean people in boston are like i just want to 
root for Brown and Tatum. I don't care that if we get, you know, if we, if we can make a trade for Kawhi or if we make a trade for Kyrie or something like that, I don't want to put all, I, I would rather. So it's more me like a Knicks fan saying, well, would you want to trade for Bradley Beal? And I'm like, sure. Bradley Beal is a beast, but I kind of like rooting for RJ Barrett. I like rooting for like the players that, that are, that, you know, do you think that, that there's too many, too much of the, you know, wanting to build a super team, you know, wanting to people, you know, rooting for the back of the jersey instead of the front of the jersey. That's saying, how do you feel about that sort of movement in fandom these days? Yeah, I, I hear you. And uh, there's two parts to that. The first part is if you're a fan of Tatum and Brown, then be a fan of them when they leave. Like I'm a Lonzo Ball fan. You know, I'm a, I'm a Lonzo Ball fan for the New Orleans Pelicans, and I got a Pelicans hat too, and I got and I got Jordans to match them. You know what I mean? Like. I'm a Laker fan, but I, I root for Zion and, and, and Lonzo. I, I enjoy both the way they both play. And then my mom being a UCLA alumni and Lonzo being from UCLA, like, yeah, like I, I root for the kid Lonzo. And I didn't want to see him leave the Lakers, but I'm not going to give away a chip so Lonzo can be on the Lakers either. So it's like, you know, if you really fans of those players, be fans for them wherever they go. Me and you off camera had a conversation about the Chargers because I, I like left the Chargers in my mind. Like I'm done with the Chargers. Like Dimitri, they're right off the 405. What the hell is the difference? Right. All I thought about that was like, shit, he's right. I can't really, like, I like Philly and I like some other teams, but I'm like, at the end of the day, I can't root for anybody the way I root for the Chargers. Like, screw it. I'm a Charger fan. Like, I don't care. They lose every year. I don't care. So, like, if you're really fans of those players, be fans of them wherever they go. Like, I know a lot of LeBron's fans. They don't give a damn where LeBron goes. They're LeBron fans, period. And then they'll talk about the team that LeBron plays on as the best team in the league every time. I don't like that part of it, but they're true LeBron fans. I have to give them that much. Um, cause like when, what you're talking about right now, like the Lakers could, are talking about trying to land, um, Beal and Beal has pretty much said on Twitter, like he wants to be with the, with the purple and gold. Um, that's now, scary. Do I like Kuzma, KCP and crew? And those are the guys that would be in the deal if Bradley were to go. Yes. And I'd rather, yeah, I would miss them. But again, just like, you know, just like Lonzo, you know, I, just like um, the other people that left the Lakers here recently, I, I'm still fans of them for other teams. But Bill helps us get to it. You know, Bill kind of helps us get to a chip, too. The only reason why I wouldn't want to see Kuzma and KCP go is because their roles are roles that, like, they can they can drop their 20 and 30s and give it nights. And it's not really asked of them to do so every night. When you put Bill on the team, there's an expectation for him to put up the same numbers he was putting up with the Wizards, and he's not getting looks anymore. Like he's the third, he's like the, he's the second or third option now. I would say the second option. Like no third option. Third option I don't. Now. I don't think there's there's a player. I don't think that there's a way the Lakers got Bradley Beal unless Anthony Davis was going the other way. There's no there's no universe where Kyle Kuzma and KCP and like the bald Mamba get you enough to, to get back Bradley Beal from Washington. You got to bring – He picks as well, obviously. But, yeah, I agree with you, though. Yeah, I don't think that – I don't think that's a win for – I mean, Russell Westbrook. I mean, I think Washington would give you Russell Westbrook for for, for Kuzma and, and KCP maybe. And we take them. Yeah, no, no. Well, I, I, and this is an interesting thing because I, I, I belong to a couple of Facebook Knicks groups, and one of the things that I've always said to them is that – Nobody, absolutely nobody overvalues their players like Knicks fans, because I, I would put out something like, well, would you trade uh, RJ Barrett for like, OK, I, I, there's a, I was like Seth Curry, right? Seth, Seth Curry has has not signed his extension for Golden State. You don't know if Clay Thompson is going to come back to full strength. They might be going into a rebuild. They got their new arena. They won three chips. You know, um, he doesn't owe them anything else. What if he's like, man, you know what I've always wondered? I wondered if you guys hadn't picked me and they, the Knicks would have picked me at eight, how my career would be in New York. I want to play in New York. And I was like, that's Seth fucking Curry. He's he's a walking bucket. He's got range when he's in the arena. Can you imagine him putting up 56, 58 points in the garden? Um, and 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 Knicks fans was like, no, I would trade him for like Dennis Smith Jr. and like a two. And I'm just like, 
so I think there's various degrees of fan sort of myopic, uh, my, uh, you know, where, where they feel that their players are worth so much more. And I think a lot of it is also like EA Sports GM, where if you are playing your season on Madden or FIFA or something and you're like, and you, and you offer them like enough bullshit, like the, the, the math engine and the PC is like, okay, they've offered enough bullshit. We will accept this trade. Yeah. And, 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 and I think what people don't understand is that NBA GMs have gotten a lot smarter over the last couple of years. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and they're not, they're not making these, these, these dumbass trades anymore. Um, if you, so, but, but you bleed purple and gold then, right? I do. We'll see. Honestly, I think the players are strong as they are. The only my, my only thing against Bradley Beal is not that it's not has nothing to do with him. It's all about how is he going to react when he's a third option. Like like Kuzma and KCP, they're they're pretty good in their roles. They know what their roles are. Caruso and the gang, they know what their roles are. Bradley Beal thinking it's going to be a walk in the park and everything's going to be lovely because you have stars around you, but you're the third option. You're not getting the same looks. And what is his attitude going to be like when that happens? That's the only thing that scares me about Bradley Beal. But if he if he's on board, hey, I'll root for the rest of them wherever else they're at. <laughs> I was a, I was a Anthony Davis fan way before he came to the Lakers. Yeah, the the brow the brow could ball, and then we got the New York the Kentucky to New York pipeline happening in New York right now. So 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 you never know. Um, do you think that that um, because it used to be in sports there was one goat, there was one greatest of all time. That was Muhammad Ali for 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 thirty years. If you said the goat, you were talking about Muhammad Ali, right? Then there's like, well, Michael Jordan's also a goat, and Tom Brady now is also a goat. Montana was a goat for a while. Um, then, then people are people throw out the the term. Oh, that's goaded. This is goaded. That's you know you're a goat. Like I bet I've been called the goat. Everybody's a goat now. Do you think that gets thrown out too much? LL Cool J really started that. After Muhammad Ali. LL Cool J was the second person. You remember when he when he took your boy Cannabis out the game? Yeah. You know, cannabis dropped uh, one of the best battle raps of all time, and he still got taken out the game. And then he tried to revive his career. By battling another battle rapper, and he had to bring out a notebook and showcase it because he could no longer recite his raps anymore. Like, cannabis got bitter in of a, a stick where it looked like he would shine bright with one of the best battle raps of all time. But LL Cool J ended his note on the the famous song Five Four Three Two One, a song that I know you know in New York hip hop, where he calls himself the greatest of all time. And really, nobody's really stepped up to LL Cool J and challenged that. So. With that being said, yes, is GOAT being thrown around too much? Yes. But the reason why it's being thrown around too much is because we want to have GOATs and then we want to have the GOAT. Like, if you want to say the greatest of all time, like when Tom Brady is a certified GOAT, there's nothing you can take away from him. Even with that MAGA hat, I would love to smack the MAGA hat off off his head and and curse him out. But I'd also have to congratulate him on a a fantastic fucking football career, too. Like, he, he, he... in my mind, could be the goat of all goats at this point. Only difference is Jordan never lost in the finals. So, you know, you have that. And, you know, Muhammad Ali, yes, but the greatest boxer that ever lived is Floyd Mayweather. Whether people want to swallow that pill or not, it's the truth. Um, So, you know, he didn't stand up. He didn't fight for social justice and things like Muhammad Ali did. So we're always going to lean more towards Muhammad and just who he was as a person. I think all of us are fans of Muhammad as a person. You know, that, that, that personality is something that's, it's captivating. Um, it's not, that's, that's, that's one of the things that I, that I always, cause I, I mean, obviously if you're, if you're looking at the basketball debate, I'm still going to go Jordan over LeBron as the goat. You never lost in the finals. Um, but if you look at LeBron's, I think Jordan can be the, the, the goat, but in terms of social impact and overall career, LeBron has a much longer, more productive career, more finals appearances, even though he lost more. But also LeBron was not never afraid of social issues. You know, when when people were getting killed left and right in Chicago for two hundred dollar pairs of Jordans, you know, Michael Jordan said Republicans buy Reebok, buy, buy, buy sneakers, too. 
You know, like he never wanted to take that stand. I know he's changed a lot. He's he's expanded his philanthropic work a lot in his later years. So I think he's doing his part, but but that's one place where that's one place where I'm always gonna give it to LeBron in terms of he was never afraid of that of putting himself out there. And leading and leading that movement and having people throw their jerseys in the middle of the court and not play. Like, you know, he was a pioneer of all those things. So yeah. I think when you talk about Go to basketball. You can go. You can go analytical stats uh, versus um, uh, versus uh, like a life journey, legacy type of thing, because there are certain components that make Le- LeBron a little bit more po- polarizing. Um, first of all, LeBron's journey started when he was basically uh, really 16 years old. He was 16 years old. He had a hype train. Then when he was 17, he was always looked at as number one pick before going into the season. He, he had a Hummer, and he was on the cover of Sports Illustrated as, the, kissed, as, as, as the next messiah. And he kissed Ashanti. Um, <laughs> before that, the high school the high school phenom was Lenny Cook. He bodied Lenny Cook, and now Lenny Cook is just out in the street, like literally just out in the street, like nothing, nothing, nothing came of it. Back when he was the guy who was tall and that could do everything, and then LeBron came in and took him off the board. But not only that, he was, he was already called King. He was already King James back then. And that's when we had a guy called Jim Rome who was like, yo, some high school kid can't call himself King. Like, what are you talking about? Like, you know, and Jim Rome was a tougher guy. And when people were hammering LeBron. So everybody looking to see what LeBron's going to do in his first game. He signed with Nike. They did a commercial about his first game where he, everybody's looking to see if he's going to fall under the hypers. Is he going to, you know, fold under pressure? And then he laughs and starts hooping. Comes out his very first game, gets 25 highlight dunks, great assist. And then, you know, like, you know, Jordan's story started after he hit a game winner and, and, and you know, for, for the Tar Heels. At that, that time, he was known as the projected uh, lottery pick, but it wasn't the type of hype train that LeBron had to, had to be under. Um, no, no, there was, there was never a, a question of whether LeBron was going to go first. Where are you at, Dimitri? Dim- we're gonna wait till Dimitri gets back here. In the meantime, as I stall, or here he is. We're uh, we're gonna light up this uh, cherry pie uh, joint here. It's got honey oil and stuff in it. You back? You back, Dimitri? Yep. One thing I will say about the LeBron is that he took a stand against everything except China. That was when he was like, uh, "There's a lot of money over there." Yeah, they buy exactly. a bunch. Of, they gotta buy a bunch of shoots. And one last thing about what you said about goaded MCs. I think Dimitri, you're forgetting that there's one MC that made one song about one rap beef that turned that song into a verb, where if you say that word now, it specifically means that you got dusted in a battle. So you know, so there's goaded, and then there's getting ethered. So if you can make a song and where now everybody says you got ethered, everybody knows what that means. So I'm going to put my boy Nas, Q Burrow, Keep It Thorough, Queensbridge in the house. A little bit ahead of LL Cool J, also from Queens. Um, but uh, but we'll take it from there. You were finishing up your thought. He definitely has the mass appeal. But uh, uh, <laughs> shout out Dave East. But yeah. Um, Oh, like, yeah, I mean, we're throwing goat around a little too much. Everybody wants to be the goat for something. Uh, there should be, uh, this, the, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the statue, the Mount Rushmore for goats. There's only a select few, you know, Jordan, Brady, Muhammad, Floyd. Man, you you might put two, throw- two boxers, huh? Yeah, only because, like, Floyd's standard of greatness is a guy who beat every bad badass that they threw at him, and he made a billion dollars. Muhammad Ali was the very first people's champ. You know what I'm saying? The Nas fade is the most legendary haircut of all time. Um, and then Jordan won six rings and never saw a game seven. Like, and, and then Tom Brady is going to be balling until he's 50. So those guys, yes. Everybody else that's kind of a goat and you're a goat here, goat at this, goat at that, like, needs to stop. Now, you were talking about, uh, we had this conversation off air too, but I wanted to bring it up, which is like uh, favorite like duos. I made a point to you where you were talking about Kawhi and PG as being like a, not a goaded duo, but if you could pick any like uh, two wings to start your basketball team, whether that's like Tatum and Jalen Brown or uh, 
PG-13 and Kawhi, I said I would take the old school Allen Houston and Sprewell at the two and the three. You give me Allen Houston with that sweet jumper and you give me Sprewell with those attacks to the rim, I would take them two over Kawhi and Paul George myself. I think that their game would translate to today because of the fact they were both tough. They played a little bit of defense, you know, Latrell Sprewell literally choked the shit out of his coach because he was, you know, um, and uh, and and when he was done and he didn't feel he was going to make enough money, he's like, fuck it. It's not I'm not I'm not playing for like no, no seven million dollars. Like he was just like, I'm good. Um, so those those would be my two to start a team. But would you still go with PG and, and Kawhi? Well, first of all, um, I only picked them originally just because they were because they had signed to the Clippers, and I'm thinking of active players in that moment. But if I get to just pick any two wings, uh, that played together, that played together, that played together. Okay, all right. I mean, Jordan and Pippen is an obvious one. Like at the two and the three, that's a fucking. You could you could you could make a. They would be the number one seed probably in a duos tournament. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Looking at that, ooh. Another, you know, like I said, Tatum and Jalen are, are are definitely right now. You could not go wrong with those two either. Probably, I'm pro. I'm I'm starting to look at like Durant and Clay, <laughs> like like that thing. Like that was that was terrible for everybody. Uh, but you have, but you then you'd have to play Durant at the three, and Durant's a seven footer, man. Durant's a four. I'm talking about real wings. Yeah, but Durant also played too at times at OKC. So I mean, just saying. But like, yeah, but uh, yeah, it, I, you know what? I want to throw Melo in there, but Melo's defense never it never comes up. But uh, and Melo, it was Melo and Stoudemire at one point. And for one year, Melo and Stoudemire were were hard to stop though for one year, and then they kind of it just didn't it, then it just dissipated. So yeah, if I'm looking at forwards, let's see what we'll look forwards at LeBron. LeBron and Bo- uh, LeBron and Bosh. Uh. Well, I think LeBron and Wade would be the two wings. When I say wings, I'm talking about shooting guard, You're shooting going guard, and, shooting guard, small forward. I'm talking about a shooting guard, small forward combination. That's why I was like Tatum yeah. and Jalen Brown, Spreewell and Houston, PG and Kawhi, the two and a three. Mm-hmm. Two and a three. Scotty and Michael. LeBron and D Wade. I like, yeah, I, yeah, Ugh. yeah. LeBron I, and Wade. I like LeBron and Wade, yeah. Paul Pierce and Ray Allen. But, but I like that duo, though. I did like that duo a lot. That's one of my favorite trio. That has to be one of, that was everybody's favorite trio of all time. You know, remember how happy they everybody was when they got together? It was like the coolest thing ever, and LeBron did. Everybody's like, "Oh fuck this! This is whack." <laughs> I, don't, I, I'm, I am not a Paul Pierce fan. I'm, I was I wasn't a fan of him as a player, and I'm definitely not a fan of him as a commentator. I think he's ass. Pierce talks. He boasts himself way too much. Yeah, he, all he does is compare everything to to me. He wants to sit, he wants to sit at the table with like Bill Russell and all these guys. Like, yeah. I still remember when he got stabbed up, stabbed up by Benzino. So I'm not gonna give him that much. You guys, st- yeah, and then he faked the injury, right? No, but he got he he got stabbed the fuck up by in Boston oh, I, when he was a rookie. Did a bit about it when uh, you know everybody used to say Jordan when they're at the park and they shoot a shot, and then they did a bit where he was getting dude was getting stabbed. It was like, oh, Paul Pierce, oh. Paul Pierce. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah, Paul Pierce. He talks like he won like eight rings and set every record in the book. It's like, no, you had you had a good run that that one year, and you know, good job, but like, chill. Uh, All right, you you're on a you're on a desert island. You have unlimited electricity, and you get to take one sports video game with you. Are you taking or one sports franchise with you on the island? Are you taking the 2K series? Or are you taking FIFA? You know the answer to that, but yeah, of course I'm taking FIFA. I, I stopped 2K in 2014. Uh, my uh, one of my roommates in college used to whoop my ass. I, I was the king in 2, 2K13. I, I used uh, 2K12. I used Kobe and beat everybody. 2K13, um, I used LeBron and beat everybody or Kobe. 2K14, I just started getting smashed, and, and I was done. I moved on, hung out with some people from the UK. They put me on to FIFA, and I got hooked on FIFA, and, and I just recently quit my FIFA addiction. Like I had to just put the game up, put it in a pot shop, and just do away with it. It was taking too much of my money and time. 
the um, the last 2K basketball game I played was the one where you could unlock Jordan by playing like all the different Jordan situations. That was the best one. I still have that game. That's the best one. The the cool the cool uh, uh, graphic art of Jordan on that cover. That was one of the last uh, really good cover arts. And now they're back with the Kobe one. They're pretty much going back to the Jordan theme again and bringing that back with Kobe. Although I would say in my in my defense, I also have played in a absorbent amount of ps pro soccer of ps uh ps uh ps yeah but that that's that that's more real soccer that, that's real soccer though so like that's kind of cool it's a real soccer simulation versus fifa you have what we call the what we call in the fifa community the player meta most effective tactics available and this is like it, it's crazy well no I've, I've i just i've played an embarrassing amount of like franchises and, and PES and FIFA. It started when I had uh, ACL surgery and I had to be on a couch on a on a movement machine all day. And I just watch It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia and I would just play season after season on Pro Evolution and on FIFA. And I still have like FIFA teams that are like from like FIFA 2010 or PES 2011 or something that that I can still turn on and I can play a couple of games and I'm like, oh, I like the squad still, you know, I, I, I keep video games because I like like the same reason I haven't had a reason to buy a Madden game for like 15 years because the Jets have always fucking sucked. Mm -hmm. So the main reason I want to buy Madden is because I want to do a season or a franchise with the Jets. But if that if if the Jets continue to fucking suck year after year, what's the point of me buying that game season after season? I also feel that video games should come out every two years because having to fucking buy a new game every fucking year is a pain in the ass. They should they should sell you a game for one year and then next year they should sell you like a roster update for like 10 bucks and then i'll buy a new game the year after that but they get so fucking greedy with the money and why wouldn't you if every time you drop a fucking game like grand theft auto you're gonna make a billion fucking dollars you know it's like why wouldn't you do it right yeah and and they're selling it to kids they're not selling it to us like we we were always putting the logistics in there but like the kids don't have that Logic. They just want to buy the game, and you know that's who they're that's who they're re primarily selling to. That's why I had to unplug myself away from a game like FIFA because FIFA Ultimate Team is just gambling. Like there was times I would open up packs out of sheer boredom, just because I was bored. I would spend some money, open up a pack like I was at a casino, and it started during when the pandemic hit. You know, at first it was like, hey, Dimitri, like you're gonna finish editing this this movie, Last Lessons, and then we got some posters coming out and Socket Channel and all of that. I got down on life when the pandemic hit. I'm just sitting around and fucking Ubering and just like saying fuck life after a while. It just got really bad. I'm just in the house all the time. And then FIFA became my new savior. Just that was my entertainment. And then I would say, okay, I'm gonna play some FIFA, but I'm gonna get back and finish editing this movie, which I am gonna finish. Like it's weird. It's like I have like five things, I have like four little corrections, and then all of a sudden I was just like, whatever, FIFA. <laughs> so um, and then that happened, and then I started realizing, holy shit, I'm putting money into this game. And I'm not even playing the game. Like I would turn on FIFA, open up packs, turn the game off, and do something, and then go and go to work. I'm like, I'm like so that's why they're making a billion dollars. And then the the but then you start to realize too, you're competing against 12 year olds, and they've changed the game when you're playing Ultimate Team. Like even FIFA in general nowadays. Like I'll put up highlights later on just to show you for fun offline. Like remember, you remember playing FIFA back when you could hit that through ball to Suarez and then go down there and shoot the goal back post. Now I'll show you a specific example. I hit the through ball to Kylian Mbappe, but because of the player meta, I can see that my angle's not good enough to hit hit the far or the near post. So I stop and do a Ramona fake and cross my legs, hit a flip flap or an elastico flick, and go around and beat two defenders to shoot the goal one on one with the uh, with the goalkeeper at an even shittier angle, but because Mbappe has steroid stats, he puts it in the post. And, like, that's what FIFA is today. FIFA is a uh, – everybody that is really good at FIFA plays their ultimate team as if it's Barcelona in 2011 with, like, Xavi, Messi, and Iniesta just playing tiki-taka tiki around the box. And then, you know, then you do one then, – then you do a rainbow flick on the keeper and kick the ball in. Like, that's how you score a goal. In FIFA, uh, that's where that's where the nature of the game is at. And then, like you said, they should come out with these games now every two years, maybe even three years, because they're adding new things to the game and new features, new bugs yeah. and patches 
every every two months now there's a new patch for 2k madden all of them you know uh right now the big thing in fifa a month ago they had the uh the step over patch lou because every guy was everybody spam step overs in order to just make a pass if you hit the step over just rotate the stick this way you hit the step over and all of a sudden you, you create an opening and you get a speed boost from the step over so then some 14 some 13 year old kid was beating everybody in champions league in the in the um in the weekend league the champions weekend league for fifa 21 because he was spamming step overs and he would get that little speed boost blow past his defender and score a goal and won 150 games like that and then people start talking shit about this kid it's like no he found the glitch and then there's another glitch that comes up in another patch so it's like and i'm sitting here like this is my life now like i'm, I'm fully engulfed in this life like i'm sitting here it's telling you my life the way it's going i'm feeling a little bit ashamed of myself so i was like yeah time to quit time to get back to being a creator again Somebody uh, in a pod, I don't remember when it was, it was like like eight or nine months ago, they're like, you know, what what, what one thing could you do to make yourself a, a better editor? And I said, get rid of my PlayStation. I said, because when I'm done with work and I've done everything that I need to do, I took care of my dad and, and I have two hours where I can sit at my desk. I have to decide, am I going to sit down and edit? Am I going to sit down and work? Or am I going to sit down and play, uh, you know, Call of Duty or Blackout or, or or FIFA or something for two hours. I got to make that choice. So letting my PlayStation Plus subscription lapse was one of the best things that I did over the last several months because I actually finished the movie. Um, I'm actually and I'm actually have been a lot more productive and moving my PlayStation to it being literally right here next to my second monitor where now it's back over there where I have to go find cables to connect it if I want to play. I haven't touched my PlayStation in like four months and my productivity has gone way up. <laughs> so. Uh, so, yeah, it, 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 I'm watching you and I'm like, damn, this dude was just editing short films and then I was editing one of them. trying to out and then all of a sudden like i just faded into darkness and i'm just sitting here like loose killing this shit like he's got stuff on every week now you're about to uh interview an nfl legend because you put the work in to reach out and stuff like that and i'm like That's dude crazy. what am i doing <laughs> like literally what am i doing so like yeah well, good, you know, good thing is you don't have to judge yourself against anybody else but yourself man we're all trying to do better each day so you know it's been a it's been a fucking rough year uh, i've had to do the things that i'm doing trying to stay creative having these things so that i can have human interaction with people because i don't go out because i'm taking care of my dad you know like like if this is a lot of people are doing things to stay ahead to be creative there's also the shit that we're all trying to do but but at the end of the day you got to get through this thing how it's going to make you be able to get through it. And if you need to fucking veg out on some fucking FIFA, or if that's what you needed to do, then that's what you needed to do, man. There's no reason to, to, to judge yourself or, or to look back at it. You got to forgive yourself and say, that's what I did. And I'm just going to try to be better tomorrow, you know? Hey, you missed your calling, man. Mentorship. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, well, you know, you know, it's, it's all love with the two and burrito family. We're all, we're all trying to get there. Um, one other thing that I wanted to touch on with you, because we we talk sports, we talk the, the challenge, which everybody should know about at this point. If not, go back to the beginning. You can hear us a broad discussion about uh, racism, uh, about, uh, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement as it pertains uh, to our little universe here uh, and about what you can do to, to get involved with it. But um how are you, um, you know, how, how, how are you liking this like fight Island, like MMA stuff with no audience? How, how does, is it, has it lost a little bit of appeal for you? Are you still kind of locked in on it or, or how, how are you feeling about the, the MMA game right now? I'm laser locked. I love it. Cause like when somebody smacks somebody, you hear that shit. Like you, hear it. <laughs> like you hear it, bro. Um, there was a guy, you know, most people that are looking at this are not that familiar with, with MMA, but, like, there was a fight where a guy won the fight with a counter elbow. So the guy goes in for the, the big overhand, and the guy sits back, and he throws an elbow, and the elbow, because the, the elbow is a short-range attack, it meets it meets the guy's chin or the guy's cheekbone before the, the, um, the punch comes in. So you can literally, all you hear is, like, is like a route pop with the elbow and like smacked him. And I jumped out of my seat 
and I like I just went berserk. I was like, dang, like, and they nicknamed it. They nicknamed it the Hellbow. Now it's not even an elbow anymore. Elbow. Because he smacked him so hard, man. Like, and and this was Jeremy Stevens, who's from San Diego, the guy that he did it to. He he fight. He trains like thirty minutes away from, thirty minutes away from us, basically at Alliance over there in uh, in, uh the upper part of Chula Vista. So, so like on one end, I'm rooting for Jeremy because like you know he's from here, and Dominic Cruz, my the guy who I, um, uh, I kind of take from the most in the MMA, and um, so I like it. Yeah, I do. I do like the Fight Island. Um, they're actually, you know, they're actually at uh, a decent capacity now. They're actually letting people into the live gate again. But um, I, I, I really liked it. I love the sound and everything. Uh, they've been putting together some uh, really good fight cards. The only bad thing about it is be not because of Fight Island, just because of COVID. Some of these fight cards kind of suck. You have, you know, you have one stat card in the middle of the year, and the rest of them have a main event and a co main event and, in a, and kind of a un unfavorable car, card. That's the only downside of it. A lot of these cards kind of dropped. The Conor McGregor card had had I enjoyed the whole card, but I mean, as far as when you have a Conor McGregor fight, knowing he's the biggest fighter in the UFC, you expect at least four good fights, and we got two. We got two main, two main pretty good fights, two really good endings, and then um, you know, you know, I only enjoyed the whole pay per view because I had just nothing to do. I just set aside that whole day to just watch MMA. And I had fun, but I still wish there were some more of my favorite names on the card. That's that's true. The reason I bring that up, uh, Dimitri, is because you are both a basketball fan and a fight fan. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, as you know, this is the time of the show where I do something that I like to call. All right, boys, you know what that sound is. It's time for Bracket Bit. That's right. That's right. We got a customized bracket bit sound. Effect slash music, courtesy Kurt, uh, enslaved by vegetables, Grewon, and Jovi uh, Sprouts, I think is your last name. <laughs> Jovi, uh, longtime two and burrito collaborators that hooked me up with that uh, bracket bit sound. And it is time for bracket bit, Dimitri. And this is where I give you the choice of one or the other. Today, because of your love of ballers and because of your love of the MMA, our bracket bit is called Brawlers versus Ballers. I'm going to give you the name of one brawler and one baller. You're going to tell me who moves on to the next round. Remember, I make the bracket, but you get to decide how or why you're choosing. You could choose which one you'd rather be friends with, which one you'd rather invite to a party, which one you'd rather, you think would fight, you th which one makes the better sandwich. Whatever the qualification is between the two, I just ask you that you keep it for the entirety of the bracket and you decide which of the two moves on. Are you aware of the bracket rules? Yes. All right, so in the Brawlers versus Ballers Championship, the first round matchup is George. There's one thing that I can do is finger roll the Iceman Gervin versus MMA fighter John Jones. Wow. Oh, you don't know how hard of a question that is. I grew up trying to finger roll like Iceman. Iceman. I, I, I love I love to finger roll, man. I, I try to mimic John Jones's fighting style when I do Taekwondo because he uses a lot of Taekwondo. Kickboxing. The good thing about the bracket bit is that I create it based on my knowledge of the sport and my choices, and sometimes it creates some tough first round matchups, as we see here today. I gotta go, John Jones. John Jones moving on. The Ice Man stays on ice. We <laughs> talked about him early. The Walking Bucket. The oh, biggest what if? Stephen Curry. He's got a tough first round matchup against the Notorious. Versus Khan. Yeah, that poor A oh, set him back. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta go. Steph. Steph moves on. The beard, which uh, people would think you were if you walked around Korea one day. James Harden versus the Gracies. Now, I didn't want to choose one of the Gracies, so these are the Gracies as a group. Okay. 
First so of these all, are the Grace, the Gracies versus. Uh, oh no, wait, wait, I messed up. James Harden versus the. I messed up. I messed up. James Harden versus Demetrius Johnson, your namesake. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. First of all, we got to get on the court, me and you, one day, Lou. You'll see that yeah. the beard skills are actually within me. But anyway. Okay. Uh, okay. Between. Demetri Johnson is literally one of the goats of MMA for real, but uh, uh, Harden's creativity and his ability to score is just unmatched. Got to go with James Harden. James Harden. Uh, my game has been described as a peak Larry Johnson without the hops. You know, like a point forward, but with the spin move, with the you know, with the big L, with the big L. So, so, so we, so we can get, we can get down. Uh, all right. So now the the Gracies as a family versus um the plastic man durant oh my god i'm actually i actually want to join one of the gracie gyms and, and, and get down on the mat and roll on the mat and learn it's a, you, you, in this world that's that's it's something you, it's a tool that you need for life uh the gracies pretty much you know they were the first people to say we got the best martial art and proved it uh but then you got durant oh Durant's the most unstoppable. Gracie's. Gracie's. Now, I have a love-hate with Durant because, obviously, I'm a Knicks fan, and I think part of the reason that he didn't go to New York was because he didn't want to have to deal with Knicks fans. So, instead, he went to the Nets. I thought when that video came out of Durant at the Rucker where he hit like six three-pointers in a row and the entirety of like the – was like – I was like – he has to understand what him playing at the Mecca would mean for basketball. Like, like I was like, if there's one person that's a baller at heart that should be able to, to like, cause that's how I felt about LeBron. Like when, when he was in free agency, I'm like one championship in New York is worth five in Miami. One championship in New York is worth five in Miami. But, and I wanted him to, to feel that. And then again, I wanted Durant to feel that. And they both did not choose the Knicks. Um, and they both have yeah. legacy all the time, right? Yeah, and they both have, and, 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 uh, and, and now we root for RJ Barrett and, and the kid Q, that's a beast. But that, that, that's my Kevin Durant uh, rant that yeah. I can do with you because you know sports. That's, that's the reason. So, yeah, Durant, suck it. You lost in the first round to the Gracies. Go eat some fucking organic fucking Brussels sprouts in Brooklyn. Cupcakes. With your, with your cupcake. Go some organic cupcakes. That's <laughs> right. And I swear, even though he's seven foot tall, if I ever saw him or ever met him, or he was like, hey, Mr. Dan, this is Lou Martinez, the director. Hey, what's up, cupcake? Absolutely. 100%. I don't care if I get fired on the spot and it's my first big break. If I get to work with Kevin Durant on a commercial at some point or Space Jam 7, I'm calling him, I'm calling him cupcake. I'm going to be right I, there. I promise you, Knicks fan, I will do it. All right. Shh. Um, <clears throat> I forgot what his brother's name. Uh, Reggie Miller broke the hearts of Knicks fans time and time again. One of the weirdest but best jump shots of all time. Even better than 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 Jer- Cheryl Miller. Hundred points for UCLA, I believe. Um, hundred points. Hundred points versus Amanda Nunez, MMA fighter. Got to get the ladies against each other in round one. Shout out to Lou. These are good. These are good. Uh, I always knew of Cheryl Miller. I'm a big fan of Reggie. I, I try to emulate his uh, that shot that looks like he's crossing his hand. Um, the uh, I can actually like literally break down that jump shot and shoot it just like him. I, I, I you know like. However, this is Cheryl, and I always knew Cheryl was a beast, and I heard all the stories. But at the end of the day, uh, Amanda Nunes is just on is completely unstoppable. Right. She's gonna be with my homegirl Megan Anderson. She, super sexy chick, crazy tattoos all up and down her leg and all of that. And but she's it's not looking good for her when she fights Amanda Nunes. She hits like a man <laughs> and she pretty much trains with men like she's she's a certified badass. All right. We got the literal logo of the NBA, Mr. Jerry West. Although if there was a logo of the MMA sport, you could good you could you could make a good argument that you could put George St. Pierre on there. George St. Pierre. Yeah, George St. Pierre is the literal goat of MMA. If there is going to be a goat, it's literally George. And uh, uh, But Jerry West invented clutch. 
He's the logo, man. He's the logo. Yeah, he invented what clutch. There was, he was the very first clutch before any other clutches. I'm going with Jerry West. Jerry West, the logo moves on. All right, here's your boy, LeBronathon versus an underrated fighter. This is a first round matchup, so I think it's an easy one for LeBron. Brock Lesnar. Okay, first of all, I just want to go back. They are going to change the, the logo guy to uh, Michael Jordan. Just, just, just yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Well, that's uh, that. But um, yeah. Can't, ha- can't have an eighty year old white guy on the logo. Come on. Uh, right. Basketball. LeBron or Brock Lesnar? Ooh. Ooh. Brock Lesnar came in and dominated instantly with a name. Like he already had a name, so he was already gonna sell out the crowd. But he came in and took and took and took the chip until he was exposed for his uh, ability to not know how to to know how to box and kickbox. And then once they discovered that, he got he got rocked. Um, it's your bracket, man. But you, you you can't go against LeBron. You just LeBron, LeBron moves on. All right, R.I.P. Kobe, and another goat of the MMA or one of the goats, Frank Shamrock. Shamrock, yeah, he was watching him made me realize that I need to learn how to wrestle. Watching all those kung fu movies growing up, thinking that wrestling was just for faggots, that fight in between men's legs. Now I realize saying the word faggot is thing. And uh, learning how to wrestle can actually help you in a real fight. So I need to learn how to wrestle. But at the end of the day, he ain't no Kobe. <laughs> it's plain and simple. Kobe. All right. Russell Brody. Uh, just because he's a baller, I wanted ballers on these lists. Motherfuckers that could come in and put up fifty and just were just, and then BJ Penn. That's the, that's actually one of the toughest ones because they both have similarities. BJ Penn broke all kinds of records just like Westbrook did, but I got the man that can uh, uh record triple doubles for two back to back seasons. That's that's just insane. Russell Westbrook is the, the first one to do it since um Oscar. Let's, Oscar Robertson, who did it for a while. So, yeah, that's incredible. I, as a Knicks fan, when they were when the rush to the Knicks rumors were starting, I was one of the people. Even though I know we've we've always kind of solved things by trying to get the superstar or the older guy. I mean, there's a litany of fucking Knicks moves that didn't turn out that they just went for it. Even when they got Melo, giving up all the assets that they did to get him in a trade instead of just waiting two more months till he was a free agent which was horrible. Uh, and the reason Melo didn't join LeBron and, and D-Wade and Bosch came in was because Melo wanted that fifth-year guarantee because he wanted an extra $30 million, which is understandable. Um, and that's the reason that that didn't happen. But I was surprisingly into the Russ Westbrook at the Garden thing when it was coming up. If we didn't have to give too much, I could buy into fucking two, three years of Brody, just lighten it up at the Garden. He would have embodied Knicks. He would have been like, if Charles Oakley was a point guard, so, 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 so Russ Bestwick would have been my pick there as well. Allen Iverson, AI, I mastered the Allen Iverson reverse crossover that he did in his first Reebok commercial after several summers of practicing it on the, uh, on, on the, on the basketball courts. Uh, one of the first things that I noticed about San Diego when I first moved out here is that basketball courts were empty in the summer which was the biggest shock that I had when I moved from New York to California. I saw empty basketball courts in the summertime all over the place. And I was like, what the fuck? Um, so I had a lot of, I, had, I always was able to get on a court. Uh, not so much in New York, but AI is the definition of a baller. Uh, but Gilbert in the NBA, MMA, I forgot the first name, uh, uh, is the choice. What was it? Gilbert Burns? Yeah, I think so. Something. Okay. Well, if it's I don't Gilbert think anybody. I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I. I. I don't know why I cut off that name there. But. But yeah, assume that if if there's a famous MMA Gilbert, that's the one that's on there. Yeah. Well, if it's Gilbert Burns, Gilbert Burns is a beast who's gonna fight for the 170 pound title against uh the Nigerian nightmare Kamaru Usman, who is literally is just 100 percent pure man. Uh, That's Christian Okoye, big time wrestler and boxer. He literally, if there's a real black, real life black picture, he would be it. Um, and so Gilbert Burns is gonna fight him for a championship, but he ain't, he ain't messing with AI from like AI's legacy from a no standpoint. And I too also mastered that crossover from the, the spinning crossover from the Reebok commercial. And people still use that move today on BallersLife.com. You still see people doing it. Not to mention John Wall. Right. 
Um, so, uh, yeah, AI, that's easy. All right, Latrell Sprewell, we talked about him earlier. And, and I think my favorite non-UFC fighter, because back in the day, he was an automatic, man. He I've seen him fight like seven-foot Koreans. I've seen him fight all types of fighters. One of the baddest Russians I've ever seen fight, uh, or Czechoslovakians, or whatever he was from, Fedor. Um, and he's got a he's got one one word name and one that's one name. I think he's the biggest what if in terms of what if he had come over to UFC like right when it started. What what is what his legacy? His name would probably ring out a little bit more than it does. Um, but Fedor versus Latrell Sprewell, two tough guys. His biggest legacy is not being signed to the UFC, which is crazy. And Dana White never liked him. I don't get it. I I don't get that, uh, and I never will. You know what's funny though, Lou. If Fedor had a nickname, it should have just been Fade. If he was Amer in America, we'd just call him Fade. Like, <laughs> catching Fades back in the day, remember? So, like, oh, you trying to catch a fight? Like, yeah, so, uh, yeah, uh, Sprewell, he was one of the first guys to be on N1. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm an N1 fanatic, so there is some merit there. I love the young Sprewell, the way he would get into the lane, do the same exact two-hand dunk every time, and then yell on the camera after he did it. It was actually pretty fun exciting to watch. But Fedor is Fedor is the epitome of mixed martial arts, so I gotta go Fedor. All right, bang like T Mac, ski mask, air it out, <gasps> uh, as 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 Jay would say, uh, and Danielle Cormier. You didn't just do me like that. That's not even fair, dog. I love <laughs> both these guys. Like again, like I know these are Penny Hardaways, but like I when I see these shoes, I also imagine T Mac wearing them. Because T Max deal with Adidas was crap, but um, well his deal wasn't crap. The shoes were could have been better. But anyway, um, God, Prime T Mac was a problem. Like that dude would just pull up at half court. Like everybody talks about Steph Curry doing that. T Mac was doing that. Like, ah, oh, but I got a Ewing jersey, and if I got a second Knicks jersey with an actual player name on it, I would have I, I would have to, it would be between like Allen Houston, Sprewell, and even an old T Mac. You know that when he was on when he when he was on the Knicks, I yeah. might I, I might like that. Yeah, he wore number three for the Knicks. That yeah, I remember that. But Daniel Cormier, man, Daniel Cormier, because he I I was I was Daniel Cormier because he has the same body type as me. So it's like <laughs> uh, until May when I get my ass back in shape. But anyway, um, Cormier though is he was closest to becoming the new goat. He was really gonna be the goat if he beat Stepe Miocic, and Stepe Miocic is just too damn good. He's the Croatian Goku of mixed martial arts, but he still, he still got, uh, he still was a champ champ, um, lightweight champion, heavyweight champion. He did it the right way. Never had a problem with USADA. Like he, yeah, he's a king in my eyes. Got to go Daniel Cormier. All right. Bang, T-Mac, dog. <laughs> yeah. Bang like T-Mac, baby. Um, what's, what song is, what song is that line from though? <laughs> Oh, I don't know, man. There's so many T-Mac bars I've heard of. <laughs> uh, Jay, that's from the uh, Jay-Z Freeway uh, song, um, even though what we do is wrong. I knew or that. what no, we I do. Uh, be right as you said it, because that beat is still in my head. Even though what we do uh -huh. is wrong. wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, another good line where he says, "Bullets whiz by me like Louisiana man." <laughs> no, no, bullets bullets whiz by you like Louisiana man. I was like, "Oh my god, that's so that's so nasty." All right, uh, I recently clicked on a video that was like uh, showing uh, white chocolate uh, highlights to white chocolate. One of the sickest passers that the NBA I ever oh, had. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, what is his name? Williams, right? Uh, one of the best passers that probably top three passers in the league of all time, along with like Magic Johnson, um, maybe John James Stott, like he top five passer. Like he had the, the, the behind the back elbow pass, the like the long uh, skip passes, a baller by all definitions. Shogun, though. Shogun had a whole era to himself where he stood alone until John Jones came along. Uh, he dominated for a good part of time, but like I said, John James, John Jones came along. Uh, Mike, Mike Williams, Mike Williams, right? White chocolate. Yeah. Uh, yeah, man. Uh, Jason Williams. Jason, uh, Jason Williams. Yeah, Jason Williams. Sorry. But uh, nah, dude, I gotta go. Jason Williams, white chocolate. When those uh. 
when those Nikes came out, when he had the patent leather Nikes, the uh, yeah, when those came out, I I I, I copped like three or four pair of those. My mom broke the bank, didn't pay light bills to buy them for me. Like I I wore those shoes so bad. I remember that Nike commercial with him and Kevin Garnett as the kid. Uh, like you said, all the amazing passes and crossovers, by the way. Yeah, Jay's got to go Jason Williams. White chocolate moves on. All right, Anderson Silva, Mr. Anderson versus another silent assassin, Kawhi. This is actually good because I put a post on uh, NBA 24-7 talk. I put up an argument that nobody could really argue. And I said uh, Kawhi Leonard is the only superstar – to go to a team for one year, and by one year I mean play 65 games and plus playoffs, win the championship without a second without a second superstar on the roster. Now he had all stars. He had Van Fleet. He had uh, 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 Siakam. Pascal. Pascal. Yeah. Yeah, and, and stuff like that. Those guys were all stars, but they're not franchise players. They're not franchise superstars like Kawhi was. He was able to make the clutch buckets, get it done, and, and get the chip. And being signed to them for only one season, like uh, everybody else has to like. Even like LeBron, he needs time for his team to jail. He usually needs a year or two to warm up and all of that kind of stuff. But Kawhi, Kawhi stands alone in that aspect. Like he's the only guy to really do that. San and Diego native. I mean, when we play ball, he's been he's got his number retired in San Diego. Yeah, and then Anderson Silva, the mate. Oh my God, the spider. Uh, he he knocked the guy out with a jab, bro. Like that. That's tough. I'm going Anderson Silva, man. He knocked dude out with a jab. I mean, everybody including myself, wants to be like Anderson Silva. All the fighters that are fighting him now look up to him. They cry when they beat him because even though he's old, they wanted to be him growing up. Anderson Silva, the, he's the king, bro. He's, he's dope as hell. All right, they called Dominic. Wait, oh, did I mess up uh, this one? Okay, because we said this other guy, Gilbert, was Gilbert Melendez, right? No, we said Gilbert Burns. So Okay, can... okay, got it. All right, so they called this guy the human highlight field, Dominic Wilkins. Um, only guy that could go toe to toe with Jordan Duncan, another baller, and then we got Gilbert Melendez from the MMA. Yeah, we're gonna have to go. I don't know as much about Melendez, but I know Dominique, and Dominique was one of the best in game dunkers of all time, and he had he had the most power of all time. The only person I've seen that can match his power. Is a guy named Doug Anderson who's not in the NBA. He plays with a uh, organization he used to work with called Court Kick. You know, he does some amazing dunks that nobody. Sean, K- Sean Kemp could 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 rock it a little like yes, close. Yeah. yeah, that's. I mean, in terms of like just ah, uh, yeah, Sean Kemp. Yeah. After, def- after- and I would say I would say Dominic Wilkins probably being a pioneer of those hard dunks like that in the lane. Yeah, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go Dominique. You know, I mean, even I mean, Janice doesn't even dunk with that much power. Uh, all right, and then finishing out the first rob, we got uh, first round. We got Larry, Larry Fitzgerald, Larry Bird, the Great White Hope, and uh, you know the current goat. Could be. Uh, if I gotta go there, I'm gonna. Uh, that's tough because, like, you you know, you you think you know Larry Bird until he, until the NBA put up his actual highlight tape, and it's like, damn, like that boy, woo, Larry Bird was something else. But Khabib is unmatched. He's just simply his method of fighting is just unmatched. It's Khabib. Uh, it's Khabib. All right, second round usually moves a little bit faster because we've already explained who everybody is, but they're not going to be any easier for you. So let's get through this. We got the second round matchup: John Jones or Steph Curry. Jones. James Harden or the Gracie family? Gracie's. Amanda Nunez or Jerry West? Nunez. LeBron or Kobe? Oh, my God, in the second round. Kobe. Russ Westbrook or AI? It's funny how this is working out. AI. Fedor or Cormier? Damn. That's a tough one. Cormier. White Chocolate or Anderson Silva? Jason Williams. Anderson Silva. Dominique or Khabib? Khabib. Or Anderson Silva? Okay, Khabib or Anderson Silva? Khabib. AI or Daniel Cormier? Cormier. 
Amanda Nunez or Kobe? Sorry, Amanda. Can't take you to the top. Got to go Kobe. John Jones or the Gracies? Jones. All right. We got our final four. Demetri Green. Everybody remember to like, subscribe to the channel. Everybody, if you want to post, uh, if you want to be a part of the Black Lives Matter Film Challenge, go to filmconsortium.com. Go on filmfreeway.com. Search for fact. BLM Film Challenge on Facebook or wherever you get your indie film news and you can also be a part of this event that's coming up live on February 13th where you can share your stories um, as it pertains to the Black Lives Matter movement over this last year or before um, and, and compete you know, and it's mostly more about getting the word out there for more people to share their stories. So I appreciate Dimitri coming on the show today to talk about that. We've done two hours and 26 minutes. This is going to be a two and a half hour pod. Um, and we're almost here at the end. All that's left to do is get through this final four in this Brawlers versus Ballers championship. I set up the bracket, but Dimitri, you're the one that has to knock it down. John Jones. In the first semifinal versus Kobe Bean Bryant, RIP. Uh, woo. I mean, they're both goats in their own sense, but I mean, damn. Yeah, Kobe scored 60 in his last game. I mean, Kobe. Kobe moves to the finals. Uh, and then in the other side, we have two legends of mixed martial arts. You've given good reasons for both of them to be deserved here. Uh, it's funny. We got three MMA, one, ba one baller, three brawlers, one baller in the final four. The choice remains for you, Daniel Cormier or current champion, right? Still champion, right? Or did he, no, he retired, right? He vacated the belt. The, the, the belt is still up as Khabib right now. Okay. Uh, versus Daniel Cormier versus Khabib. Yeah. The only, but the, I'll just say this. The only way that Khabib comes back to fight again and, is that he can get to fight GSP. If that doesn't happen, they're going to have to put up the belt. Uh, and they probably will do so with uh, Poirier and Conor McGregor part three. But, um, damn, that's so tough. I look at Daniel Cormier as my dad. <laughs> but Habib, Habib at 29-0, and 0, nobody could stop him, man. Just nobody. There's nobody even close. Not even realistically. I don't know if George St. Pierre. He's the only anomaly that might be able to solve the – the uh, Rubik's cube that is Habib. All right. What, what about what about Khabib versus Fedor in his prime? H uh, Habib would probably lose. He can't make weight. Like that's too much. He's too Fedor's just too big, and that's what I'm looking yeah. at right. Cormier's just too big, man. And he 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 got the double strap. I'm going DC. He got the double strap. All right, and that brings us to our final, Dimitri Green. We got one baller, one brawler. All comes down to this. I set up the bracket. You knock it down. Kobe Bean Bryant, number eight, number 24, Mamba versus Daniel Cormier. Uh, I love you, I love you, Daniel Cormier. Because of you, I'm going to learn uh, wrestling and jujitsu to go, around with my, go along with my striking skills, but it's always going to be RIP Mamba. Lakers, Mamba in the last one, Mamba out. <laughs> All right, man. We 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 we've said it all. Um, we've said it all, man. I appreciate you coming on the show as always, kicking off season two. Um, and I hope that people, um, you know, take the time uh, to follow you, follow the Sock Channel, follow uh, Dimitri. He's, uh, you know, just you know, last word, man. What is up with that, uh, with with the project that you told us about last time? Uh, have you moved forward on it? Are you working on it? What is up next for Dimitri, man? I'll give you the final words on what's up What's up with you. Okay, two things. Yeah, the the, the story of Sagan Penn. Um, Sagan Penn was a man who lived here in San Diego who was a Taekwondo master who uh, the police tried to beat up brutally, as so many have done before, except uh, Sagan got away with his life and killed a cop, beat it twice in court. So he got he beat a he beat a, a murder and a manslaughter case. Um, so it's a I mean I, I feel like Zagan Penn is Black Panther in real life and his story needs to be told. Uh, it was told to me uh, we were going me and Kenny were going to an investor meeting for uh, Pi Etiquette and we talked to uh, a guy named Dane and he told me about it and then I went back to my actual Taekwondo family and they all know him. So now 
I'm kind of put into it. Uh, he has connect. There's connection to his life with uh, the Nick Cannon family and stuff like that. Right now, it's in pre-production, um, seeking some investment. But right now, I the the biggest trouble I'm having is getting with the family members and trying to add them and, and have a conversation with them because they have to be involved to use his name. If we can't really use his name, then we have to tell the story around his life and not use the name. I you know I just follow that code of respect. I'm not going to use anybody's name without permission and having them be part of the compensation end because this would be something that I'll have to go extend extend and go on two year uh, pre-production run to get the actual money to fund it as a feature film and hire somebody like yourself to help me write and direct it and things like that and then they would have to be a part of uh, some compensation on a distri distribution end if, if for, to really make that movie happen. I am working at it right now. I got a little GoFundMe video that I'm editing now that I got my FIFA fix out the freaking way um but that's still a thing and the socket channel yeah i'm still forming the llc i filled out one of the forms wrong so i had to refill it out today get that llc going and then again i'll look to contract a few you know great content you know creators who have won awards in the past that are doing great streams and stuff you know to help help me out Maybe I'm like a you know like a kobe bryant uh sock thing you know um uh, so i do it yeah so that that's what's up next. So uh, I am gonna get back to uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna produce my own next uh, socket channel video on my own. I predicted in 2020 uh, that socks would become a, a, a new trend in clothing, and now you got rappers like Nav and other people rapping about socks. You got Two Chains rapping about his you know Gucci Gold socks. Now it's become a real thing. So I'm gonna start off with that video, and then we're gonna keep the ship rocking from there. All right. Well, absolutely, man. Um, so socket channel, black lives will matter. Uh, Dimitri green. Uh, thanks for being a part of the show, man. Um, obviously, uh, we work together a lot, so I will be talking to you soon. We're going to hit this outro music and then I'll be back to say goodbye to you after that. Uh, so thank you everybody for, for coming on the stream today. Thank you for everybody that commented, or if you watch this on the replay, don't forget to like the video, subscribe to two AM burrito across all platforms. So you can get notified when we go live. Uh, again, Dimitri, our guest today. Tomorrow we're talking to David Dawson from um, the Intellectual Podcast. We're going to talk a little bit about fandom, Star Wars, a bunch of other nerdy shit. And then Wednesday, seven-time Pro Bowler Nick Mangold of the New York Jets, who's got a new barbecue sauce, is going to talk to me. We're going to talk all things barbecue sauce and football related. Maybe we'll get his Super Bowl pick, and I got a couple of fun bracket bits for him. So as always, thanks for watching. This is Lou Big Cheap Burrito, and we're out.